Undeniable. Shifter's Forever Worlds Book 18, by Ella Thorne. Chapter 1 Evie shoved her sunglasses into her purse and stepped onto the bus in the driveway of Arsenault Point. She bit back a curse word. Her favorite thing to do when pissed. Curse. And foot stomping, or so her siblings said. She usually did the foot stomping thing when she wanted to release a few choice curse words, but was trying to be respectful. She had the reputation of being the most impetuous of the Arsenault siblings, and though Alexa may have favored Celine Arsenault, their great-great-grandmother, wife to Etienne, in the looks department, Evie had Celine's temperament. Evie Evangeline Arsenault was one of three white tigress shifters of the Arsenault clan of New Orleans, Louisiana. The three tigresses had an older brother, Lazare, also a white tiger shifter. Arsenault Point stood on a former plantation, originally owned by the man who'd held their father's people as slaves long before Evie's ancestor Etienne could pass. Etienne, who married Celine, had built a life for himself far from Louisiana, never uttering words of his slave heritage, thereby allowing his white gene pool to dictate the course of his life and the path of today's Arsenault clan. Evie's great-great-grandfather Etienne had been one of the rare shifters who wasn't born a shifter. She'd heard the stories and knew the Arsenault history was steeped in rumor, and many of the rumors held truth. Etienne had been turned. How he was turned was a secret Etienne carried to his grave. Etienne never planned to fall for a descendant of the man who'd been the plantation owner. Etienne fell in love with Celine. Her father gave her hand away thinking Etienne was a northerner, never knowing the truth. The old man died without learning Etienne was not only a former slave, but also a descendant of his own ancestors. He never found out Etienne had left decades ago, after being turned into a shifter in the swamps of Louisiana. That former slave had become the owner and the patriarch of a formidable set of shifters at Arsenault Point. Evie did know Etienne escaped after he was turned, making a life for himself in the North and returning many years later as a wealthy, successful, and unmated shifter. Etienne had two goals when he returned. The first was to eradicate the bloodline of those who'd held his people as slaves. The second was to take over their home. And that was how the Arsenault home, Arsenault Point, became what it was now. A home for shifters who operated mostly above the law, but on occasion, they did engage in matters that weren't fully legal. This discovery, was in the records Lazer kept in the library. Records of Arsenault pirates. Shifters who'd taken to the sea to support the plantation after Etienne returned, and made sure the scourge of slavery was banished from Arsenault Point. From the time Etienne returned, to this very day, the Arsenault clan controlled the territory east of Houston and west of Florida, and maintained order and security for shifters in the area. This was not to say other preternatural creatures didn't step foot in the territory, for they did. Some of those creatures were types familiar to the family, and some not. Most were not welcome, and inevitably conflict arose when the two crossed paths. Evie didn't need to worry about that conflict. There was only one that concerned her. Her damned older brother Lazer had invited her ex to Escape Weekend. Escape Weekend was sacred to the Arsenault. It was the celebration of Etienne's escape from Arsenault Point, and the celebration of his homecoming. And fucking Lazer has ruined it for me. Evie fumed. A day later and still she fumed. Escape weekend officially started the day before, but she'd been fuming ever since she found out he would be there. She'd heard her hunky and hot lion shifter ex, Mason Martinez, wasn't coming. Then she saw him at the cocktail party and things went downhill from there. The weekend went south so fast, you'd have thought it was shot out of a damn slingshot. One minute, she was getting ready to enjoy the cocktail party, maybe even get her flirt on, something she hadn't done since she and Mason split, and fuck if that wasn't in college, ages ago. And the next damn minute, Mason fucking Martinez, hot as fuck, sex on a stick walks in like he owns the damned room. Evie could have sworn every single female in the room, wanted him. She could see hips swaying, lips being licked, eyelashes fluttering. She'd whirled on Lazer, ready to draw blood, even if she did adore her big brother. 
except Lazer seemed as stunned about seeing Mason as she did. She wasn't buying that shit. Lazer may have been surprised, but he was the one who invited Mason Martinez to Arsino Point for escape weekend. That began Evie's seclusion. She locked herself in her room, refused to come out, refused to eat, wouldn't bathe, wouldn't answer the door no matter how many times Alexa or Maylene knocked. The morning after, Vela Tierro's voice brought Evie out of bed and to her bedroom door. She opened it for her Vela who looked well put together, not a hair out of place, fresh makeup, pressed clothing. A sideways glance in the mirror confirmed Evie's appearance. Makeup from last night mostly gone, except for the mascara which managed to create a zombie-like quality against her pale skin. Her hair was disheveled, her clothes a rumpled mess. Hey, Vela said, thankfully not mentioning Evie's slovenly state. Alexa needs your help. Seems Lazare left and Valencia hasn't shown up, and well, you're the only one who can help her. She needs to stay here and handle things, but the bus tour to New Orleans is this morning. What? Evie glanced at the clock on her nightstand. The tour leaves in 15 minutes. I can't, she pointed to the mirror. Look at me. Her voice was rising. Oh God, I sound like a toddler in a beauty pageant. Vela wasn't responding. A patient smile was plastered to her face, while her fingernails drummed a beat on the door jamb she leaned against. Evie felt guilty immediately. In a big way. But not guilty enough to go. Not if Mason was going to be there. I can't. I don't want to see Mason. Inevitably, many of the shifters opted to go on the bus tour, because it was usually a hell of a lot of fun. What if Mark talks to Mason? Convinces him not to be on the bus. Hope and disappointment battled within Evie. Damn, she didn't want to have him here with her, it was too painful. But at the same time, she didn't want him to be around all the shifter females who stayed behind. She was sure someone would offer to keep Mason company, perhaps even horizontally. Her stomach turned sour at the idea of Mason being with another woman. She clutched at her tummy as it heaved. Why did the idea of Mason being with someone else make her feel like she was on a small boat in turbulent waters? She hated that. No, she hated him. She did. She told herself that daily. Every time a sunset reminded her of one they'd shared. Every time a bit of New York cheesecake brought back memories of the times he'd come over late at night to study and brought Evie her favorite dessert. Her nose burned with the need to cry. Her eyes itched, threatening to fill with tears. She turned away from Vela so she wouldn't witness her weakness. Who cares about him anyway? He's a bastard. She stared out the front window and noticed the charter bus idling near the marble staircase that led to the front door. The driveway was almost eclipsed by the size of the bus. Evie released a deep breath and turned to face Vela. Give me a few moments to get changed. Damn, no time for a shower. Vela nodded, totally poised, completely composed. No wonder she was the alpha female for the Tierros. She definitely wore the position well. Unlike me. The spoiled bratty Arsinoe sister. Evie knew what they called her behind her back. Hell, Valencia was the baby, but most had always assumed it was Evie because of her brattiness. Vela closed the door behind her. Evie sprang into action grabbing clothes, a floppy hat to hide the mess on top of her head, and a makeup bag, so she could do something to make her look a little less like an undead creature. She'd have a while on the bus for makeup repair. God, I hope I cannot think about Mason Martinez for a few hours. Chapter 2 Sweat dripped from Evie's every pore. She badly wanted to cool her scalp, by taking off the floppy hat she tugged on her head to hide the bed head, she didn't have time to wash in style. Such a hot and muggy morning already. Sometimes, she thought she wanted to leave New Orleans. Except she knew she couldn't. Sure she could study elsewhere, sure she could take business trips, but she could never leave Louisiana for good. She stepped onto the bus's first step and looked at the driver. Thank you for waiting. He nodded. You're welcome, Ms. Arsinoe. Ms. Alexa not coming this year? She shook her head. 
I'm filling in for her. Guilt aided Evie for that. She didn't really need to blame Lazare or Alexa so much about Mason being here. Lazare walked a fine line between juggling her resentment toward Mason and being an alpha in this territory. It would have been unseemly for him not to invite Mason. And Alexa's defense of Lazare's logic did make sense, though it too royally pissed off Evie. Technically, Mason Martinez was family now, even if only because his brother was bonded to a distant Tierro cousin. Mason was Mark's brother, and Mark had taken Vela Tierro as a mate. So yeah, I guess technically Lazer did have to invite Mason. She gritted her teeth at the truth in that realization. The driver pressed the button to close the door. We'll be on our way as soon as you find a seat. The attendants will be out to see if anyone would like refreshments or light pastries for those who might have missed breakfast. Hat and sunglasses still on, Evie surveyed the packed bus for a vacant spot, ignoring the empty ones in the front row next to the door. But there didn't seem to be any vacant seats. She dropped into the first row and slid to the window, keeping the hat low so she didn't encourage conversation. Once they were on the road, she'd touch up her face and hair and try not to look like something that crawled out of the bayou. More than an hour had flown by when the driver announced they weren't far from the haunted mansion. They'd be returning to check it out after lunch and a walk around New Orleans. Evie had managed some repair to her face, but the mirror said she was still a sad version of herself. She put the sunglasses back on and set the hat in her lap. Evie? She knew that voice, she snapped her head to the left. Kate. Caitlin Byrne, her college friend and roommate for three semesters was here? Lazer didn't tell me you'd RSVP'd. Probably because I was too busy throwing a tantrum about Mason. I couldn't make it last year. I'll be damned if I'd risk missing the best party on the Gulf Coast two years in a row. But I didn't know you were here. I looked for you at the cocktail party last night. When I asked Alexa where you were, I swear I thought she gave me a dirty look, then someone came up to talk to her and she never answered. I left in a hissy because I saw Mason there. Couldn't say that. I was there at the start, then I was called away. By a temper tantrum. She knew her siblings would forgive her. She knew Alexa would get it. Alexa had been hurt before. A curvy brunette with an easy smile, Kate wrapped her arms around her. I'm glad to see you. Is anyone sitting here? She dropped into the seat without waiting for an answer. You are. So, it appears like we're having lunch at Quake again. Then a walk around New Orleans, then after that, we're going to the haunted mansion on the way back to Arsino Point. Kate laughed, then leaned in conspiratorially. As if a shifter would be afraid of a little old ghost. Quake was a large restaurant, three stories tall, with different themes on each floor with segregated rooms. But the patrons who dined at Quake weren't just anybody. One needed to have reservations, and one had to be a supernatural being. Or couple bond mated to one. Each area was set aside for a different type of supernatural, and had a separate entrance so shifters, vampires, witches and elementals did not cross paths. It was a safe place to have lunch without fear of attack. The rules of Quake were clear. There was only one true rule. No fighting between types, species or individuals or else. No one had tested the or else part in almost 150 years. That time didn't end so well. The original quake had to be rebuilt after that set of circumstances. And no one would discuss the details of those circumstances or anything else specific to the establishment. I haven't been to quake since I was a teenager. That was always Alexa's part of the hostess duty for escape weekend and we weren't allowed to go unless it was escape weekend, or we were escorted. Evie grimaced. Lazer's rules. Kate pushed a lock behind her ear. I'm sure he just wants to keep his sisters safe. I remember how he was when you were in college. Yeah, I don't think he'll ever stop being bossy. He's pretty dreamy. Kate sighed. You. That's my older brother. Evie shuddered as if she were grossed out, okay truth be told she was. She couldn't bear to think of Lazare in that way. 
Don't worry. I got over my schoolgirl crush on him. Anyway, he seemed pretty distracted by some lady he was watching at the cocktail party. Lazare? Lazare Arsenault? Are you sure we're talking about my big brother? Sexy, coffee with plenty of cream skin, full lips, eyes that make you want to drop your panties? You. 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 More shuddering. For fuck's sake, Caitlin. Quit. Okay, okay. Kate held her hands up in surrender. No one seems to know more about Quake. Got any information on the place? No. And the people who run it don't like idle speculation. It's a good way to lose your privileges of attending. How would they know? No clue. Evie shrugged. But I've heard stories. Kate leaned in, light blue eyes glimmering. No what else? She looked around as if to make sure no one was listening in. Behind her sunglasses, Evie cocked a brow. Do tell. Mason Martinez is here. Yeah, I know. I heard he was at the cocktail party. Not the party, silly. The bus. I wondered why you decided to come too. Arctic water ran through Evie's veins. No, he's not. He can't be. She swallowed a chunk of the Sahara. Are you sure? Kate pursed her lips. You think I don't know Mason Martinez? After all the nights he spent at our place, you think I don't know him? Shush. Lower your voice. Jeez. Does she have to announce it? Sorry. Kate was back to whispering. Thank goodness for sunglasses. They would hide her disgust with the idea that Mason was on the bus. I need to get off the bus now. She couldn't breathe. Her lungs had frozen. Evie put her hand to her throat. Are you okay? Kate's eyes widened. You're pale. Evie glanced out the window, watched the scenery go by, but didn't process it. Fields, marshes, flatland, it all looked the same. She bit her lower lip, chewed on it, then tasted blood. Oh my. Of course Kate had scented Evie's bloody lip. She was a shifter too, after all. Kate put a hand over Evie's shoulder, a tissue caught between her fingers. Use this. Staunch that. Every shifter on here will know what's going on if you don't get control. Your pulse, your scent, the blood. Her voice broke slightly. Oh Evie, I had no idea you hadn't moved on. How the hell can I move on? I can't even think of anything else but him. Except now. Her memories of Mason were overshadowed by one solitary heartbreaking image. Cassidy's probably wondering if I'm coming back. Hang out with you at the haunted mansion? I didn't know your sister was with you. Evie hadn't seen Cassidy in years. Sure. We'll catch up later. Her mind wandered as the countryside slid by. Memories of that time filled her mind. Nothing else had mattered to her the way Mason did until he'd shattered her heart and with it, her entire world. A bolt of pain perforated her heart. She couldn't get over him. She'd never get over him. And she'd never love another man. She was over it. Over men. She closed her eyes against the pain and thought of their first time together at Escape Weekend. Chapter 3 Several years ago, Lazare met Evie and Mason at the front door as they'd pulled up. Alexa wasn't far behind him, a warm smile on her face. Lazare greeted Mason with a handshake while Evie hugged Alexa. Did we get the cabin? She'd requested a cabin away from the main building. Half of her ancestors had lived in those cabins as slaves. The other half had lived in the main house, all culminating in the four Arsinoe siblings who remained the last of the Arsenault, or at least bearing the name Arsenault, as far as she knew. Lazer nodded. Yeah. Then he shook his head. Evie knew why her big brother was doing that. He'd stayed in one of the cabins when he was younger. Just once. Their grandfather had taken him down before an escape weekend. That was Lazer's first and last stay in the cabin. And he'd never told her why he didn't stay there again, but she'd heard Maylene telling someone he'd seen something that scared him. 
Evie couldn't imagine anything scaring her big brother. Tough, muscular, and adored by females, feared by his enemies. She doubted he was scared but then again, who knew what he'd seen down there. She'd heard the cabins were haunted. If they are, then we'd have no need to go to haunted mansions, would we? Evie loved staying in the cabins. Something about the primitive nature of the tiny abodes brought her closer to her roots. It made her think of Etienne, and thinking of him always made a flush of comforting warmth pass through her body, as if her great-great-grandfather was there protecting her. She grabbed Mason's hand. Let's go. I can't wait to show you the cabins. He glanced around the bags. Alexa will see to them. They'll be taken in or brought down. Don't you want to use a golf cart? Laser asked. They were already halfway down the tall staircase that led from the front door to the driveway. No. Joyous laughter bubbled forth. She was home. She loved coming home. Loved this place more than any of her sisters did, she was sure. She loved the history, loved the tradition and culture as much as her brother did. They ran off the driveway onto the paths leading to the cabins, a good distance walk in this case run from the main house. The paths weren't much more than footpaths, some barely wide enough for a golf cart many not. Slow down, Mason tugged her back pulling her behind a tree. Breathless from running and sheer exhilaration, she gasped for air. Mason was smiling at her, patient, used to her passion and bursts of energy. He teased her about it often enough, but always in a nice way. He pressed her against a tree, the rough bark biting into the flesh through her top. The slight discomfort from the tree was eclipsed the moment an amber glow flashed through Mason's dark eyes. His nostrils flared, his pupils dilated, and damn if her body didn't jump to attention. His body was hard on hers. A growl rumbled in his chest, his lion calling out to her tigress. In her mind, her tigress chuffed, replying to his lion, knowing they could hear one another. She nuzzled his chin, tucking her head against his chest. Mason's breath tickled the tiny hairs at her temple as he lowered his face. Her blood rushed through her at breakneck speed in response to his closeness and the scent of his arousal. Her core clenched, her thighs squeezing together, throbbing where they met. Evie gasped. God. How do you get me this way? More nostril flaring as he sucked air in. I fucking love the way you smell. It's just like the way you taste. That did it. Her body flooded with desire for him, pooling between her legs, shallowing her breathing, making life seem like it had narrowed to one focal point, and it centered on them. There was nothing around but the sounds of the woods and the simultaneous beating of their hearts. His fingers traced the hemline of her off-the-shoulder top. She held her breath as he approached the swell of her breasts. She swore her nipples jumped to attention, as if reaching for him. The pebbled tips pushed against her bra, pressing against his chest. His lips were so close to hers, she could feel the heat emanating, the warmth of his breath on her cheek. She raised her gaze to his eyes. They'd grown darker, almost black with passion. I want you. God Mason. I need you. She let the words out because keeping them pent up was sheer torture, just as not having him was. Show me. His words were a teasing taunt. Her body arched forward, almost grinding against his stiff, thick length. The third time she ground into him, he groaned, grabbed her ass and pulled her to him. You want me. He stated it. And it was fact. From the tips of her toes, to her beating heart, her pulsing pussy, her tigress every bit of her wanted all of him. The same way she knew he wanted her. He lowered himself until he was half kneeling in front of her, his hands on her skirt. Taking the hem between his fingertips, he raised it, slowing revealing her legs, then her thighs, then her panties. She sucked a breath in at having her body on display in broad daylight. She spent way too much time worrying about her body, and she knew it. Fucking beautiful. And when he said things like that, she knew she was perfect for him. Made for him. She held her breath when his fingers made the round, touching her skin, skimming the elastic of her panties from her waist, her hips, then along her thighs, teasing her flesh, making her want to beg him to breach the boundaries of her panties, to take what was inside. I need you. He growled hard. His tone betrayed that his lion was fully present. 
she heard a tiny sound that the smallest of creaks then looked down. One claw had erupted, and razor sharp it slit the satin panties on each side of her hips. The fabric dropped, useless trapped between her legs. Mason leaned in, buried his face against the strip she'd left this morning when she'd scaped her girl parts. He peered up at her, his face against her, his breath hot on her. Fuck it felt like her pussy was on fire, clenching and convulsing for him. He pulled back and ran his tongue over his lips. Oh damn. She almost fainted with desire. Legs as if made of jelly, she leaned against the tree's trunk, oblivious to the splinters that wanted to implant themselves in her skin. She lost it the second time he licked his lips. Her body bowed forward, begging, needing, wanting. She buried her nails in his hair, scoring his flesh, pulling on his hair, bringing him closer to the target she wanted him to take. Golden flakes flashed in his eyes, his lion roared, the sound clear to her and her tigress. Your body's begging for me. He pushed her knees apart slightly. She started to slide downward, wanting to lay on the ground, spread her legs wide so he could feast on her. Nah, beautiful. I want you to stand while I taste that sweet stuff. I want to fuck you with my tongue while you grind yourself against my face. Oh. My. Fuck. Her mouth had gone dry. She tried to build saliva to swallow so she could talk. Do it. God. Mason. Do it. She wasn't sure she was making sense. Nothing mattered, but the buzzing desire she had. For him to have her. To take her. Own her. Claim her. The image in her mind was vivid, him licking her, flicking his tongue over her sensitive bud, sucking and teasing her folds. She opened her legs, no need for prompting, and held onto his shoulders for support. His fingers spread her wide. He studied her, right there, on display for his viewing pleasure. Luscious, he murmured. Evie held her breath when his tongue slid out. She flinched when it alit on her clit with the tiniest of flicks. Then he began that up and down flicking thing he did. Her eyes rolled to the back of her head. She pushed on his shoulders, then pulled, her body reacting to each flick, each lick as if a live electrical wire had been placed on that most sensitive part of her. Oh. God, she panted, the words barely recognizable. Mason. No. Yes. No. She watched his tongue and lips while he voraciously feasted on her. He looked up, locked eyes with her. Make up your mind. Yes. Or no. He plunged two fingers into her and curled them like he knew how, then began to drive in and out at a furious pace the whole time, watching her with that piercing gaze while his face was wet and glistening with her essence. God I love you. Yes. God. Yes. Now. She'd not even finished her sentence when she lost control and spun into another dimension, one where her body folded in half in the middle of a monster orgasm, aftershock following aftershock while she fought to catch her breath. She leaned on him, then slowly began a slide down the tree, grimacing as rough wood chafed and tried to embed in her skin. Whoa. You'll hurt yourself. He leapt to a stand and pulled her away from the tree, holding her up, giving her the support her jelly legs needed. That was. She breathed in deeply. Magnificent. You're magnificent. He put his fingers in his mouth and sucked. Oh. Shit. You're going to make me want you again. You're getting me, as soon as we get inside. He snatched her useless panties from the ground and shoved them into his pocket. Let's get to our cabin. Just a few yards away. Heat rose to her cheeks when she realized. Mason. Anyone could have caught us. I know. Makes it better, doesn't it? You don't think they'd be able to sneak up on us, do you? Not with my hearing. True, Mason's hearing was phenomenal. Shifters had supernatural senses, but Mason's hearing exceeded anyone's she'd ever met. Fewer than five minutes later, they were standing outside the cabin, a wood cottage not much larger than a single bedroom. Evie tried the door. Fuck, she uttered the word under her breath. What's up? I forgot the damn key. I can't go back like this and get it. I smell like sex. You smell like deliciousness, he corrected her. 
Yeah, but I don't want to advertise what we've been up to in the woods. Want me to go back and get it? No. Your face. It's. More heat traveled to her cheeks at the idea Lazare or Alexa would know. It's obvious what you've been doing. He leaned against the rough hewn wood cabin. If I do something, do you promise not to ask any questions? Mysterious. That's not fair, to ask a question like that and to expect me to just grant you total liberties. She'd thought they were close. She didn't think Mason had any secrets from her. Just say yes. I say maybe. She crossed her arms over her chest. Trust me. He leaned in, his lips resting on hers briefly. She inhaled, taking in her own scent still on his face, still on his lips. How can I not trust him? I should trust him. They discussed couple bonding, and both of them were open to it. That should mean something. Maybe. She still wasn't ready to give in fully. He leaned back. Maybe. He crossed his own arms over his chest. Fine. Whatever. He nodded and reached into his back pocket, pulled out a black rectangular leather item. Like a wallet, but skinnier. He flipped it open like a book, but took a tiny tool out then another. What? She'd seen enough movies to know what that was especially when he lowered himself and slipped it into the lock. He put his finger over his lips, softly let out a short shish. Where did you learn that? Misspent youth. He rose, turned the knob, and the door opened. I'll say. W-H. No questions. She looked at the tiny implements in his hand, saw etched writing on the side. Can I see? He cocked his head to the right, his dark gaze full of intrigue. Please? Mason handed one to her. Evie turned the tool over in her hand. She read it out loud. I quit. She studied his unapproachable expression. Can I ask what I quit means, or does that fall under the purview of no questions? His smile was crooked. It is a question. Evie stomped her foot. Don't get picky with me, Mason Martinez. A chuckle slipped out, his eyes twinkling with mirth. He kissed the tip of her nose. It means I won't use those tools anymore. Not for what I used to use them for. She nodded and walked inside. She wanted to fume. Couples didn't have secrets. They shouldn't. Not when they'd already said they wanted to couple bond. Her tigress picked it up first. Emotions in the air. She scented them snarled, then made a low moaning growl, one of sadness. The door closed soundly behind her. Clearly, he wasn't happy either. His hand was firm on her shoulder, he turned her around, not roughly but enough to get her attention. His face was a grimace of pain barely kept in check. Evie wrapped her arms around his waist and put her head on his chest, listening to his heartbeat, feeling waves of his pain as they emanated from him. What is it? My best friend died the last time I used those for the wrong reasons. I made a vow then, and had I quit put on there. It's the last thing I said to him. The last thing he asked me for before he died, right next to me, in a filthy building, in a place we had no business being in. You still carry them. As a reminder. For him. For what I'll never be again. Evie held him as tightly as she could, wishing she could take his pain from him, wishing she could make it better. It meant a lot he trusted her with this. Trust. The present. Evie studied the landscape, as the charter bus kept rolling. That day in the cabin seemed so long ago. And trust. Trust was now broken between them. Completely broken. A tear broke through her damned emotions, then another, as she silently wept. Chapter 4 Mason Martinez wasn't small, not by any stretch of the imagination. He was a lion shifter, large, dark, and some thought imposing in a scary kind of way. Not that he got it. He didn't think he was all that scary, usually. He was brother to Mark, and both were of the Martinez shifters from Florida via Puerto Rico. The remainder of their family were mostly in Spain. And though he wasn't a diminutive man, 
trying to slink down in a bus seat so Evangeline Arsenault wouldn't notice him was hard as hell. He practically had to fold himself in half to keep her from seeing him when she scanned the bus for an empty seat. She'd seen forlorn, her sunglasses and a big-ass floppy hat hiding her face. Oh, Mason had been told not to be on the bus. Mark had made it a point to seek him out and tell him Evie was helping Alexa by hosting the bus tour, and he was not to be on there. Yeah, right. He studied her. Her white top was damp from the humidity and heat. It was practically plastered to her skin, showing off the curves he'd love too damn much. He swore under his breath, showing off those curves that should belong to him to all the males on the bus. He couldn't see past her upper half. His view was blocked by the bus seat's tall backs, but he knew what fell below the waist. Luscious thighs, a waist that tapered inward rising to her full breasts. Curves and flesh he loved licked suck, bit in the heat of passion. He'd loved her curves. Every inch of them created for Mason. They fit better than a key in a custom-made lock. Her body, her flesh, every part of her was made for him. He'd done everything with that body, but couple bond. He cursed the fact he'd never sealed the deal and taken her as his forever mate. Of course, Mason was on the bus. As if Mark could have stopped him. As if heaven and earth or any other force could have stopped him from getting on this bus. He was hell-bent on talking to Evie. He'd waited too long for an answer about what had happened. And by damn, he'd get one. And he'd get it today. He wasn't going to sit around this damned escape weekend facade while the woman he loved avoided him, and every other woman he had no fucking interest in threw herself at him. He exhaled in frustration. Then he saw someone. Fuck. 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 Caitlin Byrne, Evie's old roommate, was making her way to the front of the bus where Evie had plopped down. Of course, Kate had seen him and greeted him earlier. How unlucky is this going to be? Fucking Kate would probably tell her he was on the bus. At least she was friendly today, because she sure as hell hadn't been the last time he saw her. Their last year at the university, Kate had been such a bitch to him. He knew it was because of his and Evie's breakup. What he didn't understand was why Evie got so mad at him and wouldn't talk to him or see him. It was the same thing a few months ago when he was in Dallas at the Shifter Council meeting. she just fucking left the room, all pissed off to see him there. Truthfully, Mason was confused when he received Blazer's invitation to escape weekend. He was surprised he was invited. But he understood the invitation, as now he was family, more or less, since his brother Mark had taken the Arsino distant cousin Vela for a mate. So, of course, he came to escape weekend. He deliberated on it, back and forth. He'd even vacillated over the choice, but the decision came quickly, over and over again. He needed answers from Evie. Hell, he needed more than answers. He needed Evie. In his life. In his bed. Bed. Damn. That's the last thing he should have thought. His cock twitched in his pants at the thought. He remembered the last time they'd had sex, as if it had happened yesterday. It had been the afternoon of their breakup. And it had been hot as hell. His pulse raced in agreement, and his body responded, his cock straining against his pants. He took a deep breath. Time to cool down. Then he noticed Caitlin get up and return to her seat. Evie was alone. It's now or never. Mason unfolded his large muscular frame from the seat, careful not to bump his head on the overhead panel. He rolled his shoulders to break some of the tightness. She was his. There was no reason to be hesitant. Unless you counted the last time he saw her. On the mountain. After the awesome sex. All those years ago. Finals were over. Mason had sprung for a trip to Colorado for some skiing for himself and Evie. They'd met friends there and shared a condo. He'd been out in the afternoon. His lion eager to explore, he'd sidetracked to the mountains and left her at the condo. He'd asked her if she wanted to join him in the mountains, to give their felines a chance to reconnoiter and enjoy some freedom. 
She'd rolled over from her afternoon nap, her hair a lovely red mess, her lips full. He leaned down to kiss her, relishing the scent of her, and felt his cock twitch. Fuck. At this rate, my lion will never get to enjoy a run through the snow or a walk in the forest. And with that, he'd left his curvy woman taking an afternoon nap, while he proceeded to head toward the isolation of the trees on the mountains. He was almost out the front door of the condo when Todd, his college roommate, stopped him. In all, six couples had traveled together for R&R. &R. Not exactly couples. His roommate Todd brought his sister, as he was between girlfriends. Where are you going? Todd asked. Exploring. Todd's brows dipped in a frown. How about Evie? I'll be back in a couple hours. Todd nodded. We'll keep an eye on her. Not sure why. His lion roared in his head, ready to get on the way. Okay. Mason agreed, so he could get the hell out of there quickly, ready to let his lion shift and roam. He walked out of sight of the condo, stopping behind a cluster of trees. Mason listened for any sounds of life, his shifter hearing straining to pick up heartbeats or movement. Nothing. He was all alone. Exhaling a breath in relief, he prepared himself and turned his body over to his lion. The lion made a chuffing sound of appreciation. Mason steeled himself for the discomfort. A few popping sounds, then the sensation of tendon stretching, a creaking sound as his bones shifted, and within seconds he stood proud and thick-chested, a large lion with a tan mane tipped with black in places. His clothes shifted, staying intact but hidden by his lion's body. Mason pawed the snow. He'd never seen the cold powder, not in his human form since he was young, and never in his lion form. He buried the tip of his nose in it, and blew warm air on the snow surrounding his wide muzzle. The snow turned liquid. He shook his head in the snowdrift, letting his mane be covered in the white frost. How he wanted to roar! To let the power of his lion release in the deathly silent mountainous area, where the only sound was the wind blowing through the trees. But he couldn't. No, that would attract undue attention, which was the last thing he and his shifter friends in the condo needed. So instead, he let his energy loose in a lope, running and trotting, switching pace and covering much area. Fewer than thirty minutes ago, he'd left the condo and mountain behind and was picking his way amongst large rocks and snow on an isolated ridge. Hopefully, a good amount of snow would fall and hide his tracks. He didn't need anyone finding his prints and sending out a crew to locate the creature. He loped to the top of the ridge and studied the ravine below then leapt to a large boulder and scanned the horizon. The pyramid-like peaks of a set of snow, dusted sister mountains with flat faces and sharp corners. Spruce and fir peppered the mountains, growing in areas of pure rock and others where the trees were dense, almost impenetrable. His lion pounced to a large boulder, surveying the landscape, and dropped to his haunches then lay back, head erect. He wanted to release a roar so badly. But instead, he allowed himself a small series of short huffs, as if calling out to establish his dominance. Mason felt his lion's inner peace, and he let his guard down, allowing himself to reflect on the life he'd attained, leaving behind his delinquent ways, mourning his best friend, setting aside the life of questionable means, and now having found his mate. Mason was ready to move to the next step in his life, and his lion was in lockstep with him on this agenda. He pawed at the stone beneath him, claws etching horizontal white lines in the rocky surface. He should make his way back. He pushed off the rock. For a second, Mason didn't know what hit him. All he knew was he'd been broadsided and fell from the rock, careening into the ridge below. Somehow, he managed to right himself before he hit the ground, so he landed on his paws, shook up but unhurt. Wondering what the hell struck him and knocked him off the boulder on the ledge, Mason looked up at the spot where he'd been. White, with dark stripes almost blending in except for her vivid eyes, Evie stood on the boulder glaring at him. She was in tigress form, something he hadn't seen. They'd never had cause or reason to shift before. Her eyes, a light blue color rimmed in silver, were filled with fury. Even from his spot in the ravine he could see the anger. He could feel her rage emanating off her tigress. Then it hit him. 
She was what knocked him off. What the fuck? He pushed for a sink, the shifter way to communicate when in animal form. A silent verbalization that traveled from one shifter's mind to the others, accessible by invitation and opening the link. He was met with a resistance as solid as a rock wall. He pushed again, this time adding, Evie, what are you doing here? What was that about? He felt her open the communication portal between them, the sensation like a window opening and a breeze flowing through. How dare you? I trusted you. She leaped from the boulder on the ledge, landing next to him with a soft puff of a snow cloud where her paws landed. She sank into the soft powder slightly. Her fur was luxurious, shiny and thick. He longed to push his nose into it, to take in her tigress scent, to nuzzle with her. But he couldn't. She was pissed and he was clueless. What are you talking about? Lightning fast she struck him with her claws swiftly across his face. The sliced flesh smarted. He looked at the ground where red drops were accumulating, dripping from his face, forming crimson patterns in the blanket of white snow. Mason couldn't react. He'd never struck a woman, even one in her shifter form. He never would. And Evie was the last one he could ever hurt anyway. So, what was she upset about? I'm not sure I understand. Her tigress eyes glittered dangerously. The pupils weren't more than a slit. She lowered her lids, narrowing her gaze. Her tail twitched. Her shoulders and neck were stiff. I never want to see you again. Ever. I hope that's clear. And that was the last of it. She never talked to him again. Just like that. No explanations. No nothing. Present day. Mason took a deep breath. That seemed like eons ago. And at the same time, it was fresh on his mind and in his heart. It's not like she could pull that scene again, not on a bus, not with all these people watching. He paused just behind her seat. She was staring outside, the hat gone. From the reflection in the window, he could see she'd added gloss to her lips and color to her cheeks. Her hair looked smoother, too. Where did she vanish to last night? He'd overheard someone say she went to her room to pout. He heard someone else say it was because of an ex-boyfriend. He wondered if they meant him. Surely she didn't care about him anymore. She wouldn't have broken up with him if she had. He stepped forward and dropped into the seat next to her. She flinched then turned his way, her eyebrows dipping into a frown the sunglasses couldn't hide. Full lips were drawn into a stern line. His throat went dry. He tried to work it. Felt his Adam's apple moving, but his lips wouldn't cooperate. What are you doing here? Go away. Her tone was more of a serpentine hiss than spoken words. I want to talk to you. He raised his hands, took her glasses off. What the? She bit down on her lip, sealing her response away. Her eyes, green when she was in human form, were the color of the sea during a storm, and surrounded by bloodshot white. Hangover or crying. Lust bubbled up inside and threatened to overflow. Even at what she would consider her worst, when the redness made her eyes so much more vivid, she was the sexiest woman he'd ever met. Hell, she was sexier now than she'd ever been. She'd matured. Some of the planes of her face had changed, some of her curves were fuller. She was 150% woman now, so much more so than in their college day. And 1000% fuckable. Her scent was heavenly. The same perfume. She hadn't changed that. And it wasn't masking the fact she was still turned on by him. Hope grew like tiny ivy in the crevices of a dilapidated sidewalk that she might want him still. His lion chuffed in his mind. She was silent, but her glare spoke volumes. It also contradicted the scent she was sending out. Her glare warned him to back the fuck off, though her scent invited him to fuck her like he'd never fucked her before. Mason fought the urge to shake his head at the confusing messages. Her tongue slipped out, licked her lips the way it did when she was thinking of something to say. The sight of that was like touching a sexual electrode to his drive. His cock pulsed with need. Mason held his breath. I hate you. 
His muscles tightened. Seemed hate beat lust. She couldn't hate him. Could she? Why do you hate me? What did I ever do to you? A tiny gasp escaped her then, as if getting control of her emotions, she let out a low derisive laugh. Her eyes turned hard, ice chips in that deep green. Her tigress flashed silver and gold flecks. You. Have. The. Fucking. Nerve. Her words were low, ground out with such intensity and finality. His racing, raging heartbeat froze. His lion rumbled displeasure in Mason's mind. Mason pushed his beast back. Chapter 5 Evie cursed her body for its betrayal. She cursed her tigress for being behind it. She knew her tigress's feelings on the matter. Her tigress insisted Mason would never have hurt her. That her eyes were deceiving her. Bullshit. She saw what she saw. Fury blazed a trail through her body. Mason's Adam's apple worked as if he was nervous. Maybe he is nervous. Maybe he's worried my hatred for him will spill over onto my family. Maybe he thinks it will hurt their business interests. It wasn't likely he gave a shit about Evie and her feelings. Why would he? After what he did, that was the ultimate act of betrayal. Don't act like you don't know. Evie's tigress was coming out. She couldn't help it. How dare he ask her why she hated him. The image was seared into her mind. Branded with an intensity that burned brightly. What seemed like forever ago. She and Mason, and a few of their shifter friends in college, had been on vacation in Colorado. Evie woke from a nap and went downstairs to find Mason. The group of their friends were all hanging out downstairs. Kate and her boyfriend, Mason's roommate Todd who was in between girlfriends had invited his sister and three other couples that Evie had just met. Mason? He left about 30 minutes ago, Todd's sister Melissa said. That's right. She remembered Mason waking her to tell her he was heading out for a while. Evie rubbed the sleep from her eyes and took an empty mug from the cabinet. She warmed a cup of milk in the microwave and dumped hot cocoa mix in, stirring the creamy concoction, inhaling deeply, enjoying the comforting aroma of the cup's contents. Hey. Have a second? Todd put his hand on her shoulder. Evie glanced at his hand then back at him, shrugging slightly. She didn't want to offend Todd, but she didn't find him particularly likable. He was Mason's roommate, and she didn't want to create hassles for Mason, so she contained the shudder of revulsion that traveled up her spine. She couldn't peg why he creeped her out. He simply did. Sure. What's up? Though truth be told, she'd rather go back to their room and cuddle up with the hot cocoa and a good book until Mason came back. Over here. He indicated down the hallway toward the back of the condo, where the bedrooms were. She frowned but went because, well, he was Mason's roommate after all. She'd been reminding herself to keep that in mind since Todd moved in. Todd opened the door to the room he was sharing with his sister, then closed it behind him. Evie took a step closer to the door. Don't worry. I just want to show you this. He reached for a drawer on the dresser and pulled out a folder. Opening it, he held it out for her to see. It was the size of notebook paper, but clearly a photo. She glanced at it then looked at Todd. Is that? She did a double take. W-H. She couldn't make any words. No words came to her mind at all. Just an image. Burned into her mind. Mason? Mason was in the picture. And a girl on her knees in front of him. The tattoo he'd gotten the week before was evident on the forearms she'd always loved. She grabbed the dresser for support, shaking her head slowly. This can't be. This. There's no way. But yeah, there was a way, since she was staring at it. She reached for the photo. I can't let you take it. Todd shoved it back in the folder. I don't need the drama. I didn't show this to you. You can't tell Mason. Swear it. Evie nodded, not completely processing what he was saying. The only thing that seemed to be running through her mind was that image, 
over and over. Her knees felt like they dissolved, becoming nothing more than noodles. Her stomach pitched and heaved. She didn't want to swallow for fear that would bring her one step closer to vomiting, and she was already on that ledge. She turned, opened the door, and slipped into the hallway, making her way to her room, fearful someone would try to talk to her and she wouldn't be able to. The betrayal. Ah. And here she stood in their room, still smelling like him. Smelling like sex. And some girl had been. She slammed her fist into her palm. This isn't happening. She was torn between never talking to him again and wanting to hurt him physically, the way she was now devastated emotionally. And here Mason was, on the bus. Today. Threatening tears burned. Evie quelled them before they could well up. The pain of that was just as intense today. She clenched her jaw. Just go. Mason's eyes narrowed. A tick in his jaw gave away his anger, yet he said nothing. Shoulders and spine stiff, the man she'd wanted to spend her life with, the man she would never have believed would hurt her, rose and turned sharply, giving her his back, he made his way to the rear of the bus. Chapter 6 The rest of the bus ride was short, except it wasn't, because when you're reliving the hell of the past, time doesn't seem to release its relentless claws from gripping your soul, ripping into it, tearing it apart. But Evie held it together. As best as she could. And she had a game plan, of sorts. She'd get everyone situated at Quake, and then she'd find a bathroom stall and spend the entire meal in there, hiding. She'd let them assume she was flitting from table to table and room to room, visiting with the rest of the bus. Okay, maybe it was a little lame as game plans went, but it was better than nothing. The bus entered New Orleans and cruised the outskirts of the French Quarter, to the O's and A's of the shifters inside, before pulling up to the unmarked building she knew was Quake even though there was no sign on the door and no street number visible. Jostling and a bump alerted Evie, she wasn't alone. She turned toward the other seat. Kate beamed at her. We couldn't just wait in the back. She indicated Cassidy, who'd taken the empty seat across the aisle. Evie waved at Kate's sister. Hey Cass. Cassidy smiled back with a quick wave. She was typically the shy and reserved one. Evie always thought it was amazing she'd been so close to Kate, when she and Cassidy were more alike in that regard. Maybe opposites attract. Maybe that explained why she and Kate had been so close in college. Cass leaned in, across the aisle. So that's Quake. Her eyes were wide. I've always wanted to visit. Heard so much about it. Evie looked out the window. Quake. She hadn't been here in a long time. Last time was with Lazare, Alexa and Valencia. They'd come one escape weekend. Every one of the Arsino siblings. Lazare had brought them and told them they were getting older and that Alexa would have to start taking some of the responsibilities of Escape Weekend, and shortly, Evie and Valencia would have to do the same. Alexa had not stopped staring, open-mouthed, enchanted by the old building, the traditions, the rules. She'd said she wanted to be the one who organized the visits to Quake and to attend every year. And she had. Until this year. What could possibly take Alexa away from Quake? Evie realized she'd been way too withdrawn this weekend. It seemed her siblings had been busy while she was having conniption fits in her room. She surveyed the building that enchanted her older sister Alexa to such a large degree. Balconies laced with cast iron architecture over each door and in front of many windows on the second floor lent to the illusion there were several buildings not once giving any clue these original structures had been fitted into one restaurant. Not many knew that Quake occupied the entire block. Rumor had it, it took the original owners a few years to purchase all the buildings and, in some cases, with less than legal methods to persuade. More than two centuries ago, the owners had called a truce between the supernatural beings that lived in the territory. They'd held a meeting in the offices of Quake, and made the decision there would be hallowed ground where no being would harm a being of another type. Evie had heard there'd been shifters there, and vampires and witches and elementals. She'd also heard there were others, but what others, she had no idea. 
She studied the entrance they were to use into the building that was deceptively dilapidated. Shifters entered the blue entrance. The red building's door was designated for witches, the green for vampires, black for elementals. The driver pulled into the parking lot across the street and took the microphone from its holder. Ladies and gentlemen, the bus will be departing in three hours. Enjoy your visit. He pushed a button, opening the door. Warmth and humidity poured in, beating the air-conditioned temperature into bombiness. Humidity won the battle in New Orleans. Every. Single. Time. Evie felt her hair begin its transformation to springiness. Staying outside for any length of time would render her a tousle-headed mess. At the same moment, a sensation of sadness crept over her. Mason used to love when her hair was curly and wild. She let out her angst in a deep breath and squared her shoulders, rising from her seat. Next to her Kate rose, giving Evie a smile, as if maybe just maybe she knew what Evie was going through. Ready? Evie steeled a smile. Always. Think I could interview the owner of Quake? Cassidy freelanced for magazine articles. Kate rolled her eyes. Not even for one of our magazines. Our magazines meant the online, password-protected sites shifters accessed. Cassidy pouted. That sucks. Another eye roll from Caitlin. She doesn't know the rules yet. She indicated to Cassidy with her thumb. They'll cover the rules with all of us in groups of no more than four before they let us in. Groups of four? Cassidy frowned. Well, yeah. Evie went on to explain. They check for our identities. We get our own tables. No more than four per table. Some rooms have only one table, some have more. Come on. Save the questions for later. Kate prodded her sister along. Everyone's waiting to get off the bus. Indeed, the shifters were all out of the seats and in the aisles. Evie adjusted the hat on her head, pushed her sunglasses higher on the bridge of her nose and made her way down the steps. The driver held his hand out, helping her and all the other ladies. Evie, Kate and Cassidy crossed the street to the set of buildings that housed Quake. She felt Mason's gaze behind her. Felt him looking at her, as the hairs at the nape of her neck lifted. She raised a hand to ease the tingling his being there caused. The blue door was halfway down the block. They passed the black door. Two beings stood in front. Just as Evie and her friends had passed the two, a flash of lightning streaked across the sky, then a clap of thunder sounded, followed by another burst of lightning in the distance. Cassidy flinched, letting out a tiny gasp. What the hell? Keep walking, Evie cautioned. Taking Cassidy's hand and Kate's in her other, she pulled them along. Elementals. Evie knew what they were, though she'd never met one. She'd heard of them. Creatures that controlled the Earth's elements, wreaking havoc. She didn't look back, ignoring the second crack of thunder. Maylene had talked about elementals one day, when she didn't know Evie was listening. Elementals were to be avoided. It was one thing to shift and be super strong and a tigress, but Evie knew she didn't stand a chance when it came to battling lightning or windstorms. Just as they approached the front door, and before Evie had a chance to pull on the knocker, a lion's head in brass, the oversized door opened wide. Enter. A light-skinned woman with hair the color of white gold held the door open. Evie tried to glean what type of creature she was, but couldn't. Much like vampires had no scent, the woman had none, but also didn't have the crimson to black eyes of a vampire. She also didn't have the luminescent eyes of an elemental. She didn't give off the vibes of being a witch. Then again, she could be a witch, perhaps. Maybe one skilled in hiding her identity. The room their group of thirty shifters was ushered into was a large waiting area. Unlit and without windows, not that this mattered to the supernatural sight of shifters because naturally they could see in the dark. The center of the room was empty, the ceiling high. The seating was composed of benches shaped more like pews that lined the walls. Behind the benches, black curtains hung. Please be seated. The pale woman's voice didn't bounce off the curtains, adding to the hushed tone of the room. 
a hostess will be out shortly to escort you to your assigned tables after an identity check. She turned on her heel, black dress that seemed fashioned of the same fabric as the curtain swirling behind her as she vanished around a corner. Evie sat next to Kate on the hard, upholstered pew-like seat. Cassidy sat on Kate's other side. Evie was completely aware of Mason's presence. Mindful of his eyes on her. Wary he was not averting his attention from her. What did she mean by identity check? Cassidy inclined closer, her voice a tiny whisper. Keeping her gaze down, certain not to look up and meet Mason's dark eyes, Evie answered her. You'll need to prove you're a shifter. Proof? The only way to prove that is to shift. Evie nodded. Partially so, at least. Everyone who comes here has to prove what they are, so they can be sat in the appropriate areas. What if? Kate tucked a stray lock behind her ear. What if they are more than one kind? Evie pondered the question. I don't know anyone that is. She shrugged. I'm sure that sort of creature exists, but I've never met or heard of one. Cassidy drove her fist into her palm, though she did it lightly. See? This is exactly the kind of thing that would make a great article. Another woman came out. Similar long black robe but with dark hair and dark skin. She pointed at Evie, Kate, Cassidy. Follow me. Then a different woman came out, again, robe similar. She pointed to the next four in the group, indicating they should follow. Several more robe-clad women came out, and the bus full of shifters was escorted out of the room, one small party at a time. Evie, Kate, and Cassidy were led down a short hallway, to another room. The hostess pulled the dark curtain aside, indicated for the trio to enter, then followed them inside, allowing the curtain to close behind them. The room wasn't much larger than a photo booth. No place to sit. No decorations on the black walls. Identities, please. She gave them a small smile. Evie remembered this part of the visit from the time she came with her siblings. She concentrated a brief second allowed her tigress to take over and gave way to her claws extending and canines dropping, while her face began a shift. The hostess nodded, and Evie's tigress pulled back, allowing Evie to return to full human form. The hostess then turned to Kate, who followed suit, and a brief moment later she'd extended her claws and opened her mouth to reveal her canines, as her face began a swift morph into her leopard. The hostess nodded, her gaze swiveling toward Cassidy. Cassidy's face was one of wonder. She was clearly thrilled by the process. She enthusiastically began an immediate shift, claws, canines, her own leopard's face emerging. The hostess nodded. Cassidy morphed back. Miss? She placed her fingers on the hostess's arm. A question, if I may? The robed woman looked down at the hand, as if it were an insult to be touched. A barely disguised grimace crossed her aristocratic, high cheekboned face. She pulled her arm away slowly. No questions. I'll be presenting the rules. Her voice was without accent, not giving away her origins. Cassidy's hand dropped. Her throat worked as if she wanted to say something, but couldn't quite get it out. She nodded. No interactions with other types. The woman glanced at each of them individually not turning her piercing gaze from Evie until she'd nodded her acquiescence, then doing the same with Kate, and finally Cassidy. No questions about Quake. Evie, Kate, and Cassidy nodded. No fighting between types, species, or individuals. Three more nods. Wait here. She flipped an abrupt 180, then was through the curtain and out of sight. This is like that movie, Cassidy said. You know, Fight Club, what with all the rules. She released a nervous giggle. They don't play. Don't do anything, Evie warned her. I won't. Trust me, I won't. And yet, there was something about the glint in Cassidy's eye and the stories Evie had heard from Kate that made her nervous. She'd have to make sure she kept her eyes on the younger Burns sister just in case. The last thing I need is her screwing up and pissing off Lazare. He'll blame me for sure. Chapter 7 Within moments, the hostess returned. Follow me. She led the way down an empty hallway with blue walls. 
Stay where the rooms and halls are blue. Other areas are forbidden without a quake hostess. She then turned left and held her hand out with a flourish, indicating they should enter. The room was small, had four tables, each table with four chairs, except one that had three. This was the table the hostess led them to. Evie chanced surveillance as the hostess led them toward their spots, since she hadn't been to the place in a long time. It was still sleek, sexy and dark, with lighting that was diffused and subtle. The wall's colors matched the type of paranormal, but in a subtle, non-obtrusive way. They were devoid of artwork that could have been deemed controversial, dotted rather with occasional abstract oil paintings. Stopping at their table, the hostess held out the chair for Evie, then Kate, and finally Cassidy. Enjoy your visit at Quake. She produced three black-covered oversized menus from a holder attached to the wall. Wow. Cassidy looked around, then opened her menu. So basically, right now, there are witches, elementals, shifters, and vampires in this building. Talk about a place to start a brawl. Her voice was low and odd. Bite your tongue, Evie hissed under her breath. For fuck's sake, Cass, Kate murmured. Don't say shit like that. It's true. This would be the perfect place to start a supernatural world war. Evie gave Kate a look. One of these days, I may kill her. Only if you beat me to it. Cass winced, and Evie realized Kate had kicked her under the table. I'm not planning. Jeez. I'm just saying. Don't. Evie's tone was final. The hostess entered the room followed by four shifters, all guests of Escape Weekend who'd been on the bus. They nodded at Evie, greeting her with a quick smile, then followed the somber black-clad woman to their table. Two different hostesses followed, accompanied by shifters. She turned her attention back to Kate, who was quietly chastising her younger sister. Evie? Evangeline Arsenault? She glanced up at the sound of her name spoken by a male voice that sounded oddly familiar. She studied the man. Todd? She cocked her head, not completely sure because this was a very different Todd than the one she knew years ago. Todd Scanlon? He was buff, clearly spending a lot of time in the gym. The brown bear shifter had gained a lot of muscle since the last time she'd seen him. The memories of that day. The sheer agony of seeing the evidence of Mason cheating on her was too much. She felt faint and her face grew cold. Her body began to follow suit, the chill spreading throughout. She glanced at Kate and Cassidy, who were looking at her strangely. Or were they? Maybe she was seeing things. Maybe she was losing it because all she could visualize was the sight of Mason as she left him in the snow in Colorado. Yes. Imagine seeing you here. He put his hand out. She rose then took his hand, thinking they'd shake, when he pulled her into an embrace that was tighter and stronger than she wanted. It's good to see you, he whispered in her ear. Thank you. You too. Not really. Considering the last time you saw me, you showed me something that broke my heart. She should be appreciative, really. If he hadn't, then she'd never have known the cheating bastard that Mason was. But still. Something about Todd Scanlon creeped her out. Again. She forced a smile to her face. It's good to see you, Todd. She pulled away. Todd gave her an odd look when she couldn't read, then stepped back. Yes, I'll be lunching over there. He indicated the table where the hostess waited for him to join the rest of his party. Perhaps coffee later? I'm afraid I'm on a tight schedule today. I have to get back to Arsenal Point for the ball. Ah yes. The famous or is it infamous Arsenal Escape Weekend. When will I get an invitation to an escape weekend? When hell freezes over. Like I want to see a constant reminder of that picture. I'll talk to Lazare so he can look into it for next year. Todd nodded. His thin-lipped, cruelly handsome face held a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. Time to go. He glanced at Kate and Cassidy. Good to see all of you. No sooner had he walked off than Cassidy released a breath as if she'd been holding it. He's intense. I don't think he recognized or remembered me. Kate noted. Because he was full-on focused on Evie, Cassidy said, glancing at Todd's table. In a creepy way. 
She shuddered. How do you know him? He used to room with my ex-boyfriend back in college. You mean Mason? Cassidy asked Kate, then quickly slapped her hand over her mouth as soon as Evie's head snapped in Kate's direction. Caitlin looked down, attempting to hide a sheepish expression, but not before Evie caught it and narrowed her eyes. I was just catching Cass up. No problem. It shouldn't have been a problem. Really it shouldn't, but the wound was raw all over again. Seeing Mason. Seeing Todd. Not so gentle reminders of betrayal and what she'd lost. Suddenly, the idea of getting lost sounded better and better. The bathroom stall could provide a haven, at least during lunch. I'm going to play hostess for a bit. Order me whatever you're having, she told Kate. Wait, Evie. Kate laid her hand on Evie's arm. I'm sorry. I didn't, I wasn't trying to hurt you. Her eyes were filled with genuine pain. I know. She patted her friend's hand. Kate's kindness made tears threaten to flood Evie's eyes. I'll be back after a while. Kate nodded. Want me to go with you? Kate clearly remembered Evie's penchant for running and hiding, especially in bathrooms when there was nowhere else to go. You'll be back in time to eat? To get on the bus. Evie gave a sideways nod, not really saying yes, though she knew that was what she should do. She should eat her lunch. She should get on the bus. She should pretend none of this mattered. Yeah, that's really easy when the only thing that keeps running through my mind is the image of another woman's mouth on my man's cock. Chapter 8 Mason walked through the blue halls of Quake. He wanted to see Evie. That was his sole mission. He waited patiently through all the pomp and ceremony of Quake. He got the rules from the hostess. He acknowledged he understood. Stay in the blue section. Shifters only. Of course, Evie wouldn't be anywhere else. But he'd break every and all rules if he needed to. He had to see her. Wanted to peek in on her and make sure she was all right because his lion was going nuts, roaring and kicking up a fuss in Mason's mind that something was awry. That something was very, very wrong. The hostess led them to their table. He was seated with a group of shifters he'd just met. His lion growled for Mason to find her. Mason smiled at the other guests. He'd slip out now. I'm going. I'm going, Mason assured his lion when the creature roared impatiently. Excuse me. He pushed his chair out and slipped into the hallway. Glancing in both directions, he headed right. He pushed the curtain aside on one room, though he felt certain he wouldn't find her there. No scent. And another room. Finally, he found her scent. She was in that room, across. He approached slowly, cautiously. Her scent grew stronger. Taking the curtain's fabric between his fingertips, he pushed it aside slightly and glanced around the room. No Evie. Several tables. Several shifters in different stages of eating, but no Evie. Fuck. Then he saw Caitlin Byrne. She was sitting with another female. He recognized her. Caitlin's little sister, he couldn't remember her name. Mason frowned. And there was an empty seat at the table. Maybe that was where Evie was sitting. Maybe Evie took a quick trip to the restroom. It's fine, he assured his lion. See. No reason to be concerned. She'll be back in a few moments. He studied the table. The lion roared. Caitlin's plate was empty, and so was her sister's. But the plate in front of the empty seat was untouched. The hairs on the back of his neck rose. A ripple of worry traversed the length of his spine. Something's not right here. His lion growled. I'm agreeing with you, damn it. His lion snarled in response. Mason sucked in a lungful of air. Here goes nothing. He was sure Kate would hate him. Wasn't that how it went? Didn't people usually hate their best friend's ex? He strode to Kate's table, as if he had every right, every reason to be there. As if he and Evie weren't exes, and she didn't hate his guts or anything like that. 
He noticed Kate had a smile on her face. Until her gaze closed in on Mason's face. Smile gone. Scowl in place. Her lips lost their curve and flattened into a thin line. Mason Martinez, she said. Her sister, who'd had a neutral expression on her face, gasped. Shit. Great. So clearly, her sisters heard my name. Hi, Caitlin. He rested his palms on the chair in front of him, the one at the place with the uneaten food. Where's Evie? Why do you care? Not going to do this. Just wondering. He indicated the plate with a nod, not removing his hands from the chair's back because he had a white-knuckled grip he wasn't willing to relinquish. Right now, it was the only outlet for his barely contained anger at her hostility. He'd done nothing to Evie to deserve this kind of bullshit treatment from her and her friends. Maybe it was time he had it out with her. Maybe instead of making sure she was okay, he'd do exactly what his lion wanted him to do, which was exactly what he wanted to do, corner her ass and make her tell him what the fuck went so goddamn wrong with their relationship. Yeah, it's safe to say I've moved from sad to mighty motherfucking pissed off. Kate's face was a well-guarded fortress, not yielding a thing. She's not here. Clearly. He clenched his jaw to keep from lifting the chair and smashing it into the wall. Or worse. No problem. Thanks for your non-help. He'd fucking find her. He'd sent her. He spun around and left the room, he and his lion seeing everything through the haze of anger. Room to room he went, no sign, until he'd reached the restroom. Her scent was strong, coming from the ladies' room. She was here. Or had been her for a while. Every time a woman walked in and then out, he caught her scent. His nostrils flaring and his lion chuffing. He'd ask the next woman going in to check for her. Then he saw her. Caitlin's little sister was approaching the restroom door. Except she wasn't focusing at the door. Her stare was fixed on Mason. I was looking for you. His eyes became slits. Suspicious, he asked, why? Is she not back at the table? No. And something seems off. She's been gone a long time, and that guy she knew, he left and never came back. She shrugged. Could be nothing, but... Another shrug. What guy? Todd. Todd something or another. Mason drew back. He studied her face for signs of duplicity and found none. Her scent didn't reveal any deception either. It's not like I know many guys named Todd. Just one. Does she know more than one? And? If it was his ex-roommate, why? Why was he here? Last Mason had heard, Todd was on the East Coast. This was pulling him away from his goal. He needed to know if she was in the restroom. Can you make sure she's not in there? He pointed to the restroom with his thumb. Sure. Seconds later, though it seemed an eternity, she returned. She's not. But she was. I can send her. And her scent says distress. What? Wait here. Make sure no one comes in. He shoved the swinging door open. I have to get back, she said, her voice fading as she moved away. Well, hell. If a woman walked in, he'd just apologize. He entered the bathroom. All the stall doors were open. Obviously empty. He narrowed her scent down to the far stall. She'd evidently spent some time in there, hiding. He knew her tendencies. She dealt by running and hiding. That was Evie's way. Cornered she'd fight, sure he knew that. God knows she'd shoved him off the ledge that day in Colorado. She would fight, but she preferred not to deal. He used to tease her about that. A melancholy smile curved his lips. He caught the sadness of his expression in the mirror. He also caught that he looked like hell, haggard and sleep-deprived. No surprise there, he missed his mate. It hit him hard as hell when he saw her. He'd thought he was over her. No, I didn't. I just fucking ignored the emotions. He inhaled deeply, sucking in her scent, analyzing it. She was here. Her scent reeked of sadness. But Kate's sister was right. There was another scent. 
panic, and yet another scent. Mail. For a brief second, Mason accessed his memories of the time Todd Scanlon had been his roommate. This was Todd sent. He was fairly certain. What the hell happened here? He stepped out of the bathroom. Caitlin's sister was gone. He looked down the hallway. Empty. A low whistling sound grabbed his attention. The sensation of a pinch was followed by a flash of searing pain in his thigh. Mason glanced down, his eyes taking in the dart embedded in his thigh, just as everything lost clarity, and his field of vision narrowed to a tunnel that quickly degraded to a pinpoint of light traveling toward darkness at a rapid speed. Then everything went black. Chapter 9 Evie shoved at the fur covering her. She had to be dreaming. She pushed at the thick fur, but it was attached to something massive. She wriggled, half her body trapped beneath the thickness. She realized immediately she wasn't sleeping. And she sure as hell wasn't dreaming. Her head felt like someone had filled it with cotton, but otherwise she was awake. Her lids didn't want to open. She so wanted to go back to sleep, to lose herself in the fur wrapped around her like a blanket. Her tigress released a piercing cry in her mind. The cry became a howl, raising Evie from her partial stupor. She forced her eyes open, adjusting quickly to the darkness surrounding her. The fur wasn't actually a blanket. A large brown bear was next to her, breathing deeply, seemingly asleep. What the fuck? The bear opened one dark, gleaming eye, staring at her. She didn't move. She couldn't shift fast enough to defend herself from the bear. Before she could have another thought, and certainly before she could act, the bear began a swift transformation, shifting into his human form. Todd Scanlon Memories came rushing back to Evie. She'd been in the restroom. There'd been a knock on the stall door. Thinking someone needed help, she'd released the latch. She hadn't anticipated the door flying open, almost knocking her down. Grabbing the stall's painted steel panel walls, she'd steadied herself. When she'd looked up to see who'd knocked, Todd Scanlon stood at the entrance. Her first thought had been, what is he doing in the ladies' room? Her second thought, why is there a guy behind him holding a pistol? That had been her final thought. The gun made a loud whisper sound and a soft pop. A piercing stab tore through her bicep. She hadn't had a chance to glance down, she was too busy struggling because Todd had grabbed her other arm. Then everything faded to black. And now here she was with Todd Scanlon. Wherever here is. Because she had no fucking clue where she was. She looked around the dark room. Empty walls. No table. No chairs. Nothing but the mattress she was on, which was on the floor. Across from her, a door with a tiny window. It's more like a fucking cell. He wasn't captive with her, was he? No, how could he be? She was not naive. She knew what had happened. They'd used a trank on her. She swallowed the chalk dust that had accumulated in her throat. Why? That was all she could manage, until she cleared the chalkiness from her throat. Todd had completely taken his human form. He placed a hand on her hip, tracing slow patterns on the fabric. Do you know how long I've wanted you? He raised himself onto one elbow, his fingers still making circles. She cringed and put her hand next to his, pushing it away firmly. Get away from me. What's the problem? His voice almost sounded innocent. You drugged me, you asshole. Really? He frowned. What do you mean? Yeah. Surely you know how I feel about you. Where the hell is this coming from? If she'd been a cartoon character, her head would be spinning. That was how she felt right now. He continued talking, as if the look of horror she was sure was plastered on her face wasn't evident. Everything I've done, everything I've built, it's all led up to this moment. We can finally be together. He'll be out of the way permanently soon. I understand. He ran a hand through disheveled hair. His expression was full of sympathy. You're conflicted, you're torn between the two of us. I get it. There were a series of flashes in his eyes, 
and it was more than his bear's amber glow. She tried not to stare but couldn't help it. His brown eyes had tiny pinpoints of white in them. She'd never seen that before. It was like little starbursts in the brown, regressing and returning like tiny Christmas lights. Torn? She may have been mesmerized by the phenomenon on his eyes, and she might have the aftereffects of the trank, but she wasn't so out of it that she couldn't process what he was saying. What do you mean torn? Him. Me. He studied her face as if searching for comprehension. You're torn between me and that bastard Mason Martinez. She shook her head. This is. I can make it so he doesn't pull on your tigress anymore. So you can concentrate your love on me. Fully. He thinks my connection to Mason is only my tigress? Todd. She thought she'd try for logic and reason. If that didn't work, she'd shift, but she wasn't holding hope for being able to do anything against the tranquilizers she was sure he and the other guy had. I don't think you understand. No, really? Look. He reached across her, his body lying on her. She was almost ready to shove him off when he sat up on the mattress they were on. You'll change your mind. He held up his cell phone. He tapped on the screen. Look. He turned it her way. Recognize anyone? She gasped. Mason? Mason was on the phone screen. In a cage. No. My God. No. Quicker than she could expect it, Todd's hand flew out, his knuckles hard as he backhanded her. Evie's head snapped back. She put her fingertips to her mouth. Blood. Her lip throbbed and her tigress roared, urging for a push, wanting desperately to kill Todd. Wait. Baby, I'm sorry. Todd grabbed her shoulder and pulled her close. Baby? What the fuck? She pushed away slowly, regarding him as if he were a rattlesnake. Hell, a rattlesnake would have been more predictable. She couldn't let him see how she felt. How much it upset her to see Mason in the cage. What? She fought to control her emotions. I'm not. She wasn't sure what kind of trap this was. Your scent tells me you still care for him. You're releasing the indicators of concern. Even your pulse jumped when you saw Martinez. He reached out, placed his index finger on her neck lightly. This little vein was throbbing the moment you laid eyes on him. Evie slapped his hand away. I don't know what game you're playing. She left traces of her blood on his knuckles. You belong to me. His hand snaked out quick, serpent-like, and seized her behind the neck, yanking her close. His lips landed on hers. Flat. Cold. Making a lizard come to her mind. No sooner did the thought strike her, and before she even had a chance to react to his kiss, his tongue squirmed into her mouth, seeking hers, slithering, exploring. She jerked back. What the fuck? Before she could stop her, her tigress slipped out, sharing control with Evie. Her claws extended, her hand darted forward, slashing at his face. Todd's hand flew to his cheek. He pulled his hand back, looked at it. It was covered in crimson stripes, matching the ribbon slashes she'd left in his flesh. You bitch. The starbursts in his irises began a quick winking, menacing in the brown pools. His expression changed, running a gamut of emotions, anger, lust, disgust, disappointment and a few others she was unsure of. It's like he's on some sort of super steroids for emotions. I hope this doesn't happen when he shifts into his bear. He picked up the phone he dropped at some point, then pressed the screen. Raising it to his mouth he said, let's have fun. Send in two shifters. No three. Over his phone speaker came but boss, I thought we were going to have him fight tonight. Well don't let them kill him you idiot, Todd snapped. He tapped on the screen again, then showed her Mason. He was still in the cage, but stirring. Todd stood. Come with me. No. Hell no. Fuck no. Let me out of here. My brother will kill you. Your brother can't even figure out what's been happening on his own territory. He's been too busy chasing that tail. What? What are you talking about? He raised a brow. You don't know? You haven't seen his new woman? 
Even my surveillance team knows. What the hell is he talking about? But it didn't seem to matter. Not when she thought of the image of Mason in a cage, and the words Todd spoke about sending three shifters in. Come with me, or I'll rescind my order to have him live. What's happening tonight? What was that guy talking about? The one on your phone? A little sporting event. Shifters on shifters. A nice little cage match. It makes me a sweet living. You do that? You have shifters fighting shifters? Involuntarily. Is that why he kidnapped me? Why he took Mason? You want me to fight? No. I want you to be mine. By my side. To be my mate. Over my dead body. Over Martinez's dead body, you mean? He smirked, his features now more than ever reminded her of a reptile. Let's watch your ex-boyfriend try to hold his own with three shifters. He took long strides toward the door. You drugged him. How can he possibly have a fair chance? She rose to her feet and on shaky legs followed him to the exit. Fair chance? He whirled around, eyes glistening from the starburst patterns. What do I care? Turning he jerked the door open and strode into a long dark hallway lit with bare bulbs that hung every few yards. The hallway smelled of sweat and death. A shiver passed over Evie's spine. She tried to hold her breath to avoid smelling the stench but it was impossible. She struggled to keep up with Todd's long strides. She was beginning to get the picture. She remembered overhearing Lazare talking to Vax about the underground fighting ring that had been skirting between the two territories and more. She hadn't really paid much attention. She had other concerns as the marketing director for Arsenault Business Enterprises. She tried to remember what Lazare had said, but no specifics came to mind, except they didn't know where exactly the headquarters were for the fighting rings and they didn't know who exactly ran it. God I wished I'd paid better attention. The odor of the hallway was pervasive, and it stuck to her. Shifters died here. Sacrifice to Todd Scanlon's twisted ambitions. They were nearing the end of the hallway, where a set of double doors with clear panels awaited. What was behind the doors? Would she see Mason? Would Mason be dead? And then she heard the roar. It reverberated in her mind and bounced off the walls. Behind those doors something very large was very pissed. Chapter 10 Mason fell backward. The bear before him roared, flanked by two more bear shifters. He stood over Mason, six-inch claws raking at the air. The bear was lost in a wave of red from where blood poured from the wound on Mason's forehead, just above his brow, a two-inch deep gash from the bear's black claws. Mason swiped at his eyes so he could see better. He pushed for a shift, needing his lion to step up and help, but the trank had fucked him up. He couldn't push the shift into place. His lion paced and rumbled in Mason's head. His anger surged, the adrenaline already pumping through his body at breakneck speed. The bear dropped to all fours, his mouth wide in a threatening grimace. Sharp canines, long and yellow, drool falling from dark lips and a crimson cavern. He opened his mouth to release another bellow. Now, goddammit. Shift. Now. He pushed his lion, knowing his inner beast had no control, but not knowing what else to do. Fuck. Fuck. All he needed was less than a minute's diversion. He could pull his kit out of his pocket and be out the locked door, leaving behind the three bear shifters that were going to kill him. A scream pierced the air, angry and full of wrath, interrupting the bear's roar. All three bears turned to look at the source. Evie. Her mouth was wide. Her shriek relentless. Next to her stood that bastard Todd. Mason noticed the gouges that crossed Todd's face. Something had transpired with Evie. Mason also noticed she'd been hurt. Abrasions marked the face he loved more than life itself. Then his lion scented her blood and roared. Forget the kid. He felt himself beginning a shift. Nothing would stop his lion now. Snapping bones and a grunt followed by crunching and tendon stretching tearing then reforming, and his lion in all his massive magnificence stood before the three bears. His lion leapt, flying through the large cage, landing on the lead bear's back, 
digging his canines into the bear's neck with an incapacitating, relentless grip. He shook his massive head, severing the bear's spinal cord, rendering him a threat no more. The two other bears leapt on Mason, claws digging into his side, fangs seeking purchase in his throat blocked by his thick mane. And throughout all, Evie's scream was in the background. Chapter 11 Evie stopped screaming. The bears had piled on Mason's lion. And though she could see Mason's lion moving beneath them, she knew it was a matter of time before they inflicted enough wounds to make him bleed to death, even if it wasn't an immediate kill. Then she noticed them. Six more shifters were watching the fight from the other side of the cage. Not actually in the cage, but were they backups? There's no way Mason can make it through this alive. She grabbed Todd's arm. Make them stop. They'll kill him. Why should I? I'll do whatever you want. Anything. Just. Make. Them. Stop. Her voice was a shriek, but it didn't override her tigress's roars in Evie's head. Anything. His eyes did that starburst thing. His smile was cruelly evil. What Mason had done in that picture was pushed aside. She wasn't going to let him die this way. She nodded. To save Mason. Say it. Anything. You promise. His fingers took hold of her chin, held it with a vice grip and pulled her closer to him. His other hand tucked her body against his, mound pressed against his thigh. He moved his thigh, rubbing against her. Evie fought the nausea from Todd's touch and tried to concentrate on Mason. He lowered his palm from the small of her back over her ass, cupping it, pulling her even closer. Halt, Todd commanded. The two bears looked at Todd. Give it a rest. The bears lugged their bodies off Mason and lumbered away, shifting into two men that were more like hulks of muscle and attitude. Their clothes rumpled but still on, as they always were after a shift. Removing a set of keys from his pocket, one of them opened the door. They slipped out and promptly locked him in. One spit on the ground outside the cage door in disdain. The other shifters milling about behind the barred enclosure turned to their friends and clapped them on the back. Mason was unmoving. He's dead. Evie's knees gave out, and she began a collapse to the cement floor that smelled of death, blood, and bleach. Todd caught her, holding her against his body. I doubt that. He nodded to one of the men. Check the lion. The man leaned down and put his hand between the steel rods of the cage. He felt around, then still squatting, he raised his head and looked at Todd. I got a pulse. See? Todd said to Evie. The man's yell interrupted her response. He raised his arm from the cage, his hand dangling from the limb, held in place by a tendon. Mason was on his feet, bloody, unsteady, roaring. The man turned toward his friends. One had stripped his shirt off and wrapped it around his useless hand. Get him to a doctor, Todd barked. Martinez will pay for that. Yuri was one of my best fighters. Our deal didn't cover the lion shifter fighting tonight. It only covered this afternoon's scuffle. Tonight he fights. One on one. To make it fair. Look at him, Evie hissed. He's in no condition to fight. He better hope his shifter powers heal him quickly. The starbursts began their minuscule flares in his eyes. You can't do that. I can. And if you don't hold up your end of our agreement, I'll make sure he doesn't walk out of there alive. Just a tiny amount of trank, and he won't be worth shit in the ring. I won't back out. But I'll make sure you don't live long enough to carry through on your threats. Let's go. Now. He yanked on her hand, pulling her toward the same set of double doors. We're going upstairs. You're taking a shower and getting dolled up. You're my date at tonight's event. Chapter 12 Mason was in a cage. How long had he been in Todd's custody? Had it been more than a day? Had they kept him sedated for a long time? After he killed one of Todd's shifters, they'd transferred him to another cage in another room, then left him alone, a curtain covering all four sides. He'd lain there unable to move, letting his body heal in his human form as best as he could without an actual hibernation heal. 
He'd be far from 100%, but he couldn't afford to go into hibernation now. It would make him way too vulnerable. He flexed his muscles and flinched when a gash in his shoulder split and began to see blood once more. He'd overheard Todd's shifter henchmen talking about a fight and how Mason was the featured attraction. That it had garnered the largest crowd they'd ever had, and security was spread thin. Hopefully, I can use that to my advantage. Mason was almost ready. He felt well enough to give it a shot. They'd taken his cell phone, but they'd left his wallet and kit. He glanced at the locks. Those wouldn't be a problem. The problem would be the shifters running loose on the other side. Here goes nothing. One painstaking move after another, he rose to his feet and held on to the bars for support. After taking the kit out, he was through the lock in no time. Like riding a bike. He thought of his promise to Augie. Hey man, it's not as though I'm doing it for the wrong reasons, he reassured Augie, wherever he was. Augusto Ray Ramirez. God, he missed Augie. He relocked the door behind himself, then put his kit up. Then slowly inched his way around the curtain, away from the door, because if anyone was looking for him, that's where they'd come in. He flattened his body against the cage, trying to move the fabric as little as possible. The area was quiet, but he could hear voices from another room. Many, many voices. The audience was here. Maybe I can get lost in the crowd. He looked down at his bloody clothing. Not for long, that's for damn sure. He'd have to find something to wear that wouldn't attract attention. At the opposite end, the room was dark, but that didn't mean much to his shifter sight. Darkness never gave a shifter problems. Mason moved to stand against a wall. That would give him some protection from prying eyes. He took a second to orient himself and listen for approaching footsteps. Five seconds passed. Ten seconds. Nothing. Total silence. He took a step forward. He needed to find Evie. He didn't believe for a second she was here of her own free will, but when he'd asked Todd's punk-ass shifter guards, they'd given him no indication, snickering at his questions. He concentrated a moment. Calling his lion forward, he slipped into the beginning of a shift, allowing his claws to extend from his fingertips. Shoving one razor-tip nail through the curtain, he drew his finger down slowly, slicing through the fabric easily. Mason moved the curtain aside just enough to look out. Coast was clear. There was a door on the other side of the room, and curtains hung in rows, clearly indicating more cages, possibly more shifters. If there were shifters here, why were they so quiet? Then it occurred to him. They were probably Trank Ed. He was the main attraction. Maybe that meant he was the only attraction. He'd make a quick dash to the door, then he'd come up with the next part of the plan. He took a deep breath. Here we go. Mason sucked air into his lungs, hoped he'd healed enough to have the energy for whatever he was getting into, and sprinted toward the door, passing curtains, slipping between the covered cages in the darkened, oversized warehouse of a room. His eyes were trained on the door. He'd stop just to the left of the window that was shoulder level and chance a glance through the pane. He noted the dim light shining through, but couldn't tell what was on the other side. Just when he'd reached the door, it flew open, striking him in the shoulder. Damn. Blood began to ooze again, and he nailed his body against the wall next to the door, hoping it was a human with no shifter sight to see him in the darkness and no shifter noses to pick up the scent of his blood. Mason. Mason Martinez, a voice came from the darkness. Chapter 13 Evie let the hot water wash over her. It stung where he'd backhanded her. Then it began to throb. She was sure it was nothing compared to what Mason was going through. And she knew Todd Scanlon was well aware the only way Mason could heal would be if he'd go into a healing hibernation. That would make him vulnerable and difficult to awaken to defend himself. So basically, Mason was screwed. There was no way he could heal. Hot tears of frustration merged with the scalding water cascading down her face. This may not be the time to cry, but she couldn't stop the tears. She had never felt such despair. 
Okay, maybe she had. She thought of the picture of Mason and that whore who was going down on him. Why do I even want to help him? Her tigress howled in her head, the sound painfully loud. Evie glanced in the mirror for one last moment, ignoring the knock on the door for the second time. As if it matters what I look like. She was in the clothing Todd had provided. She'd found it laid out on the bed when she come out of the shower. A shudder ran through her at the creepiness of the idea he'd been in the room while she was behind the frosted glass shower door. She surveyed the vision that looked back at her in the mirror. The dress Todd had picked out complemented her skin tone, allowing the undertones of latte to glow. The shimmering green evening-length sheath emphasized her auburn hair and clung to her curves way too tightly. Fuck. This is a size too small. She tried to take a deep breath. Clearly Todd liked his women to be dressed a little on the sleazy side. She tugged the bodice up, seeking to cover her cleavage a bit more. Either that, or he can't tell what size a woman is. She glared at her reflection in the mirror, then turned and opened the door. It's about time. Todd's eyes had that odd sparkle again. Thought I'd have to break in to get you to join me. Todd was in a black tux, blood-red carnation boutonniere vivid against the dark fabric. He leaned against the door's frame, his eyes appraising Evie, running the course of her body, making her cringe with every sweep of that dark, eerie gaze. I'm ready. She tried to draw his transfixed stare away from her body. Tonight you're mine. He licked his lips. Over one of our dead bodies. Hopefully yours. Todd escorted her through dark tunnel-like hallways. She recognized the concrete passageway. It was the same route they'd taken when she'd watched Mason fighting in the cage earlier. Except there was a difference now, light coming in from windows of the double-door entrance where the hallway ended. The sound of conversations, the low buzz of talking, infiltrated the long tunnels with their rustic unfinished cement floors. Todd's men surrounded them, two in front, two in back. All six stopped at the entrance. Evie couldn't see in the windows as they were blocked by Todd's muscular thick henchmen. Todd nodded to one. He opened the door. Todd stepped over the threshold onto the black polished floor. Evie paused to get her bearings. The warehouse setting had been transformed to an opulent coliseum. Attendees were attired as though at a black tie affair. Glittering evening dresses on the women, black and white tuxedos for the men. She took it all in, absorbing as much as she could. A large cage was in the center of the room, surrounded by seating and waiters that floated seamlessly from guest to guest, balancing trays with champagne flutes and cocktail glasses. Shifters didn't drink, they weren't affected by alcohol, so clearly the alcohol was for humans in attendance. How can shifters allow humans to witness this? How can shifters do this to their own kind? She gave Todd a dirty look. He stared at the visage before them, his face painted with lust. He enjoys this. He likes the blood sport. A waiter approached, handed Todd a flute. Todd nodded to the waiter, then turned to Evie. Drink. He handed her the delicate crystal. She shook her head. Her stomach was roiling from stress. She'd vomit if she drank. Now. His lips flattened into a line, a tick appeared at his temple. Or else. He didn't need to tell her what the or else part was. She put the glass to her lips and drank down the bubbly liquid that tickled the roof of her mouth. She lowered the flute. All of it. Evie fought back a grimace and downed the contents. I don't even like champagne. Good girl. Todd's smile was victorious and didn't reach his eyes. Bastard. The guests turned slowly as they realized Todd had entered. Many nodded, some waved, and all stared at Evie. She tried to focus on their faces, striving to find one she recognized, someone who could put a stop to this madness of shifters fighting each other for fun, but her world felt like it was beginning to spin. Bewildered, she looked to Todd for answers. He was studying her carefully. That's when it hit her. You motherfucker. He'd given her something. It made her mind feel as though she was moving through sludge. It made her body feel encased in quicksand. Let's go. He took her hand, pulled it over his forearm as if she were holding him, 
then covered her fingers with his palm, keeping her in place as if he were escorting her. She barely noted they wound their way through the crowd, then to the other side of the room, around the milling guests. On the back wall, a brushed metal elevator door awaited next to a flight of stairs. I think we better take the elevator, Todd announced. Evangeline isn't feeling 100%, he told his flunkies as if he didn't know why she wasn't feeling well. As if he isn't the cause of it. Evie kept her mouth closed. She wasn't sure she could control her anger at the situation. She had no idea what he'd given her. She wasn't aware of any type of drug would do this to a shifter. The elevator ride was smooth and quick, the doors opened to a private box overlooking the Colosseum setting below. Evie bypassed the plush seating, making her way methodically toward the glass pane window. She took her steps slowly, her feet felt sheathed in lead boots. She held on to the polished wooden bar at waist level and leaned her forehead against the cool surface of the window. Below her, dead center of the area, a cage surrounded an arena that resembled a large boxing ring. The cage's bars were constructed of shiny, obsidian-colored tubes. Lights, many lights, reminding Evie of a theater stage were poised above the cage, ready to spotlight every bite, ever slash, every injury. And Mason's going to be in there with God knows who, and God knows how many. A shudder of pure horror and fear made a wave over her body. The guests were laughing, heads thrown back. Buzzes of their conversation made it through the glass, thanks to her supernatural shifter hearing, and Evie could pick up portions of dialogue. My money's on the lion. I'm betting on the bears. When was this put together? I just got the text today. These were portions of the exchanges below, enhanced by laughter, the clinking of toasting, the murmur of flirting. How can they do that? Wait and relish with anticipation to witness the death of another. In the glass's reflection, the door opened. A large man with close-set dark weasel eyes approached Todd, who'd remained by the door. The man whispered something in Todd's ear. Todd's eyes widened, his face paled. When? Where is he? Who the hell dropped the ball? He turned to one of his flunkies. Watch her. Todd looked at Evie. I'll be back. You stay. Like I'm a fucking dog. He closed the door behind him, but not before Evie heard one word. A name. Mason. Chapter 14 Mason thought he recognized the voice. A touch of Southern with a French flair. Could it be the head of the Arsenault clan? Why was he here? Lazare. I thought that was you, Mason. Yes, it was Lazare's accent indeed. Relief coursed through Mason. Tension fled from already overtaxed muscles, sore, and in some areas, still suffering from the claws and sharp teeth of the bears that had attacked him. From behind Lazare appeared a curvy blonde, followed by Lazare's sister Alexa and Reese the wolf shifter. Or maybe it was Rory. He wasn't quite sure right now. Then after them followed the large lion shifter, Lazare's head of security, and a curvy dark-skinned woman with glowing eyes. The rear was brought up by Reese's twin Rory, assuming the first wolf shifter was Reese, and a curvy redhead that Mason knew only too well, the baby of the family Valencia. The entire Arsenault clan was here. Did they hate him as much as their sister Evie did? As if that matters. Finding Evie is all that matters. His lion roared in agreement. We need to find Evie. The words burst from his mouth uncontrolled. Laser frowned. Where is she? What the hell happened to you? She's with my ex-roommate from college, Todd Scanlon. Scanlon, Rory hissed. Mason frowned. You know him. Word has it, that's the name of the one running this underground fighting ring. That's right, Mason confirmed. How'd you get in? I know someone. Laser motioned for Theo to step forward. We need to find Evie. Are your men in position? Theo nodded. Do we really want to start a stampede of shifters, trying to get out? What if we don't her find in the melee? Lazare turned to Mason. Why does he want my sister? He's had an obsession with her, since she and I were together. 
And what are you doing here? Valencia stepped forward. Mason studied the attractive, curvaceous Arsino sister that reminded him of Evie, and a wave of sadness coursed through him when he noticed the way the wolf shifter Rory put his arm around her. Clearly they were a couple, the way Mason had wanted to be a couple with Evie. I need to get Evie to safety, and then get the hell out of Louisiana. It did him no good to be around the place they had memories in, no good to be around her family, and most definitely no good to be around her. There's something you should know, something's off with Todd. What do you mean? Alexa pulled away from her wolf shifter Reese and stepped next to her brother. His eyes. They have this twinkling thing going on. Tiny white pinpricks of light in his eyes. Like little showers of stars. The woman with the odd glowing eyes, bluish silver pools against her dark skin, was standing next to Theo. She stepped forward. He's affected. Mason studied her. What was she? Step back, witch. Lazare's voice was a low growl. Another growl, this one from Theo, overpowered Lazare's. She's my mate. Don't. Alexa put her hand on Lazare's bicep. Brother. Her voice was soft. Lazare nodded. This can keep. What do you mean, affected? Mason veered the conversation back on course. He's losing the battle with a curse. His beast is going to kill him, but not before Todd Scanlon kills others. It's a long, arduous process, painful and difficult for the one affected with this particular disorder. So this is some sort of curse, Leandra. Alexa's voice was on the panic side. Is it contagious? Could this affect Evie? No. It's called Bronson's Touch. It's not known to be contagious. She will not be affected. Not by this. But she could be killed if he goes into a rage. What are we waiting for? Valencia fumed. Let's take care of him, Lazer said. It's not that simple. This came from the witch, the one Alexa had called Leandra. The group looked at Leandra expectantly. He's far more powerful than an individual shifter, even more powerful than several, depending on how far he's deteriorated. Let's find Evie. Mason was tired of pissing around and wasting time with talk. Let's, Lazer agreed. The door opened behind them. Chapter 15 Evie had to help Mason. She started for the door. The shifters guarding her moved into position blocking her way. Move. Let me go. Mr. Scanlon said you stay. Don't hurt her the flunky in back said to the one in front. Mr. Scanlon will be pissed. Right now, she was getting pissed. Her tigress was even more so. A burning in her tendons told her she was going to lose the battle, and her tigress would win, shifting into her feline. Moments later, after creaking and bones crunching, Evie shifted with more than enough discomfort, taking on her tigress's form. The smell of the shifter's aggression was thick in the air. It fueled her tigress's fury. We can't attack her. We can't hurt her. I'll be damned if I'll let her kill me, one said. They shifted almost soundlessly, signifying to Evie they were adept with shifting and did it often. One was a large bull with lethal horns, the other a huge bear dripping saliva from dangerous canines. Fuck. They stared at her. She decided to take the matter in hand, and moving quickly and quietly she charged, leaping high and landing on the bull's hind quarters. Gripping his hide with her claws, she tried to get purchase on his neck. The best chance she had was to sever his spine. The bull's bray was angry and demanding. Out of the corner of her eye, Evie caught the bear's movement. The ursine roared and raised his mighty paw. Drool suspended from his mouth, his lips flaccid but his teeth were deadly and long. The bear glared menacingly. Evie's tiger roared, the sound reverberating in her head and in the small room. Roars and growls, combined with the bull's brain, filled the area. Her attention was focused on the bear that was going to try to kill her, while the bull she was on bucked. Furniture went flying. Wood cracked. Glasses and plates on tables set for an opulent meal flew in all directions. The floor was a slippery mess. 
The bull lost his footing in the slickness and slipped to his front knees, bucking and propelling Evie through the room. Her head struck the thick glass pane window and bounced off, landing on her paws, her vision blurry. She shook her tigress head to clear it and faced her two enemies. The bear released a huff and closed in with a speed she didn't expect. Rearing backward on hind legs he swat with his claws, missing her by inches. She slammed a paw into the bear's neck, then drew her razor-sharp talons through the thick fur and skin. The bear pulled back, blood gushing from his throat. Frozen, Evie stared. She hadn't expected to take him out so quickly. A roar ripped from the bull's throat, sounding less like a bull and more like something far more dangerous. Adrenaline rushed through Evie's body. The door flew open. She recognized the man, one of Todd's, in his human form. And he was holding a pistol. She saw the trank. Well, fuck. Her tigress howled in fury and frustration at what they knew would happen next. God damn it, there has to be an antidote to this shit. If she got out of this alive, she was going to talk to Lazare and the Shifter clan heads. Surely there was a way to avoid the effects of the trank. The dart stung Evie's front leg, burying deep into the muscle. You two are worthless, the shooter said to the other two shifters. She's one little female. For fuck's sake this is ridiculous. That was the last thing Evie heard before her vision turned into a tunnel that began to close rapidly, drawing to a pinpoint of light, then fading into nothing but a soundless blackness. Chapter 16 Mason studied his former roommate. He still found it hard to believe Todd had gotten so much bulkier than he was in college. Isn't this a cozy little gathering? A sneer planted itself on Todd's features. He stepped into the room, reached out, and flipped the lights on. The room was bathed in the light from the naked light bulbs hanging high above their heads in the warehouse room that wasn't opulent or occupied like the room that would hold the shifter fight. Where's Evie, you bastard? Mason ground the words out. His lion pressed hard for a shift, ready to pounce on the bear and rip him into shreds. A dozen shifters followed Todd into the room, standing behind him in a semicircle. With them, there was a groggy Evie, held up roughly by three of Todd's henchmen. Her eyes were glazed over, her expression slack. Her vibrant attitude and expression were subdued. Let her go. What the fuck did you do to her? Mason rushed toward Evie. Todd stepped between them. Three of his shifters joined him, making a barrier. Todd's eyes glittered with the sparkling stars Mason had seen before. Evie shook her head, then tried to wrestle her arms from the shifters holding her. They let go. She started to slip to the floor, crumpling in place. Get her. Mason darted around Todd and grabbed Evie just before she hit the concrete. Motherfuckers. Rage surged throughout Mason's body. He held her up while Todd and his shifters moved toward the center of the room. Twenty more shifters showed up and blocked their exit. Mason studied the opposition. We're fucked. Todd nodded toward one of his men. Give her the antidote. Yeah, as if I trust them. Get the fuck away from her. Mason's growl came from deep within his chest, part of it his lion, the other part his own. Chapter 17 a stabbing sensation in her thigh pierced the cloud Evie was encompassed in. She glanced down. A syringe was buried in her flesh, the shifter holding it was pushing the plunger down. She'll be back to normal in seconds. I need a stash of that stuff. She tried to form words. W-H, where? What? I N N N need. Her words sounded like mumblings of a drunk person. Andy thought S-S-S-H-H-T-U-F-F. The spot where he'd injected her felt like it was on fire, and the fire traveled throughout her like lava in her veins. God damn it. Motherfucker. Son of a bitch, Evie yelled. She startled herself because her words were clear and very loud, and her head wasn't in the fog anymore. She was leaning against Mason, and for a brief second everything they'd been through, all the pain, all the betrayal, it wasn't there. It had slipped from her. All she could process was that Mason was here. To save me. Across from her were an assortment of her family and friends. 
all her siblings their mates perhaps. When did that happen? Confusion and relief coursed through her. You had me worried. Lazare's eyes were dark with amber flares, showcasing his concern. This isn't a family reunion, Todd snapped, his voice petty. Evie whirled in his direction, wrenching herself free of Mason's hold. She slapped Todd across the face, her tigress's claws extended, slashing him once more. You'll pay after you're mine, he grunted, his hand rising to the flesh wound. I think not. Mason stepped between them, then was joined by Lazer. I'll make you a deal, Todd offered. The two of us in a cage. Winner gets Evie. Agreed. Mason's fury glowed gold in the background of his eyes. I'm not a prize to be fought over then doled out. You can't. Leandra's eyes glowed as she addressed. He's affected. He'll kill you. Are you sure which? Lazare's jaw muscles worked. Theo growled at Lazare's tone. We'll discuss this later, Lazare told his head of security. Theo nodded, not giving an inch. I'm very sure. Leandra pointed to Todd's face. Look at his eyes. He's affected. No shifter can kill him. One on one, Todd said again. Will no one face me? Evie stared at the starburst pattern in Todd's eyes. He'll kill you, Leandra told Mason. Valencia stepped forward. Put him in a cage with me. I'll handle it. Her eyes had a dark wash to them, crimson turning to black. Evie couldn't take her gaze off her sister. What the hell is up with Valencia's eyes? You can't. Evie grabbed Valencia's arm. Todd laughed, the sound more like shards of glass cracking. Look at the Martinez and the Arsino, willing to let a woman fight their battles. I have an event to host. He turned to Mason. You weren't the only attraction. Todd glanced at Lazare. I'll let you make a decision. My help will know where to find me. He closed the door behind him as he exited. His small army of shifters stayed behind, against the door, blocking the exit. Valencia planted her hands on her hips. Trust me. Leandra stepped forward, her fingertips cool on Evie's forearm. Your sister knows what she's doing. She can handle him. Come this way. Away from their ears. Alexa indicated Todd Scanlon's shifters, who were studying them with interested gazes. Alexa pulled all of them away from the door, toward a far corner of the large room behind a curtain. Once they were in place, Evie had questions. But you said no shifter could defeat Todd. So how can you consider my sister as an option for this? Evie began. She felt Mason's gaze on her. No. Rory put his arm around Valencia. I can't allow this. Valencia turned to face him. Their mating bond was obvious. It made Evie wonder. What the hell have I missed while I was in my self-imposed isolation? Let me put an end to this Cretan's miserable existence, Valencia said to her mate. You know what I can do. Rory shook his head slowly. I know but... Valencia's eyes turned darker, pure black, irises and pupils merging into a solid color. I need to. Leandra stepped closer to Rory, put her hand on his arm. Her bloodlust hasn't been easy to control, even with my help. She has needs that you and I don't understand. She's not the first shifter with those. I've read the records. Records? Evie was puzzled. What records? What is this bloodlust thing? What the hell is going on? Rory frowned, remaining silent. His gaze on Leandra was fierce and full of anger. Then he turned that same heated stare toward Lazer. You're endorsing this? You're willing to put her life on the line? No fucking way. A growl escaped with Lazare's words. His tiger's fury flashed amber in his eyes. Valencia turned on Lazare, and quicker than he could respond, her claws were on his throat. Brother? Her voice held an otherworldly tinge. There are things I need to tell you. Things I haven't. That I should have. Next to her, Rory nodded. Valencia swiveled to face Rory. And things I should tell you. Nearby, Leandra nodded sagely, as if none of this was a surprise to her. 
It is what must be done. Rory will do this as your mate. Of course, I'll do anything for her. Rory's tone was baffled. You know that, don't you? He drew Valencia close. Evie watched them. Their couple bond was obvious. But there was something more, something deeper between her sister and this wolf shifter. What happened to you? Evie whispered, not realizing she'd spoken out loud until Valencia turned toward her. Funny, her younger sister who'd always been her peer, always been like two peas in a pod in so many ways, was different now. Valencia had a poise to her, a self-assuredness she'd never exhibited before. She's like a huntress, was the thought that came to Evie's mind. But a huntress of what? Valencia cocked her head, studying Evie as if measuring. Measuring what? What she can share with me. Valencia, what is it? Alexa glanced at her sister then surveyed the rest of their group. Was she the only one who didn't know what the hell was going on here? She looked at Mason. He seemed as confused as she was. At least I'm not alone in this. Vampire, Valencia started. I was. She paused, cleared her throat. Tears filled Valencia's eyes, making the crimson to black color change appear even more odd. Valencia bit her lip, then opened her mouth, revealing fangs. Not shifter fangs. Vampire-like fangs. What the fuck? You're a vampire? A hybrid, Leandra said. And she needs to hunt. Scanlan will do for now. But I have to feed this, a shudder made her body ripple, this thing within me. She turned toward Evie. A vampire attacked me. He blood shared with me. I have bloodlust. I will have to hunt. And you will be with her always, Leandra told Rory. It wasn't a request. And? As she took a deep breath, Leandra's body heaved with the effort to take air in. Theo put his hand on her back, as though supporting her. Leandra continued, the vampire that did this to her is bound to her now. If he dies, Valencia dies. If Valencia dies, he dies. Her voice was low. Shit, Reese exhaled. Exactly. Rory nodded. I'll never leave her side. I can't agree to this battle with Scanlan. It goes against everything I believe in, everything I hold sacred. There's no way in hell I'm letting my mate, a woman, get into a cage with the crazed beast that this disorder will turn him into. Rory. Theo's tone was patient. Must I remind you of her fight with the vampires? She did that on her own. She handled that herself. Rory shook his head, driving his fist into his palm. I can't. No. A tight circle formed. Theo, Leandra, Rory and Lazare, all discussing Valencia's proposal. Evie felt the brush of air whooshing past her, but it took her a few seconds to process what had happened. She glanced around. Where's Valencia? All of their group began to look around. Valencia had vanished. Faster than the blink of an eye, she was gone. What the hell? Rory stormed toward the door blocked by Todd's shifter henchmen. Alexa and Reese grabbed him, brought him back. Let me go. Rory's voice was a low snarl. Simmered down for a moment. Lazare's voice was low. Rory settled into a spot between Lazare and Alexa. Lazare began, it's not going to serve us to try to storm these guys. There are more on the other side. We could be easily caught up in a battle, while Valencia is out there doing God knows what. Evie had a feeling she knew what, Valencia was going to fight Todd Scanlon. This is all your fault, she hissed at Mason. His head snapped in her direction. Mine. You're the one who. He shook his head as if in disbelief. Never mind. At least I didn't take pride in a picture of me with a girl sucking my. Lazare raised his hand. Not the time. Sorry, Evie mumbled. He was right and she was a sorry bitch for switching the subject. Just because Valencia thought she could handle the situation, didn't mean she could. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, Mason said. But we'll finish this later. Evie shook her head. Denial from him. Such bullshit. What did she expect? 
Let me talk to them. Alexa indicated the shifters guarding the door. We have to appear to be willing to go through with this, then when we get there, we'll figure it out. With a confident stride, Alexa took off for the shifters. Evie kept her eyes glued on her sister. She'd leap to her defense in a heartbeat if needed. Lazer turned toward Theo. You have men outside? More than enough. But this room is blocking my cell phone signal. Lazer glanced around. I'm sure that's not an accident. As soon as we get out of here, you get your men ready, have them come in. It could get ugly. Alexa waved for them to approach. Evie tapped Lazer and Rory on the shoulder. Let's go. Chapter 18 Mason slipped away from the group and made his way toward the spot he knew Valencia and his former roommate, Todd Scanlon, would be. Assuming Valencia made it to Scanlon, and assuming he was willing to take her challenge, he found the room he'd first been held in. And he found the cage that had imprisoned him. He wondered why Scanlon didn't put this in the main room. Maybe he doesn't want the public to witness this. Why not? Light shone on the cage while the rest of the room was dim. The cage was so brightly lit, it resembled a theater stage. And it wasn't empty. Valencia was in the cage, and across from her, Scanlon was pacing the 15 foot by 15 foot area. His arms were crossed over his chest. At least two dozen of Scanlon's shifter staff stood behind the cage, waiting, watching, their eyes wary. If I win, Scanlon was saying. Valencia laughed. The note in her tone made a shiver run down Mason's spine. This wasn't the Valencia he knew when he and Evie were together. Valencia's eyes were so dark crimson they appeared almost solid black. You. Win. Scanlon nodded. You don't know what you're dealing with. To the contrary. Valencia's voice was hollow, devoid of emotions. You do not know what you are dealing with. Her lips curled into a dangerous smile, revealing fangs that didn't belong on a tigress shifter. Do you really think your little affliction will give you the power you need? to defeat me. You don't scare me. Scanlon's manner was boastful. Mason stepped toward the cage. You can't do this, he told Valencia, his voice raised. This is my battle. I get Evangeline if I win. Scanlon smirked. It doesn't matter to me which one of you is the victim. Valencia studied Scanlon, her eyes narrowed to slits. What makes him think Evie will simply become his if he wins? Mason wondered if Bronson's touch made Scanlon delusional. Surely, he had to know Evie was no pushover. He approached the cage, but his former roommate's henchman intercepted him. Let them be, one of the shifters said. If we're lucky, she wins, another one mumbled. A third one nodded in agreement. Why do they want him to lose? That means he'd be dead. They'd be unemployed. Valencia glanced out the bars, her eyes meeting Mason's. Where are they? He knew she meant the rest of her family and her mate. Looking for you. How'd you find me so fast? These were Mason's accommodations. Scanlon spoke so lightly, as if Mason had been a guest, not a prisoner. More or less. Mason noted the sparkle in his eyes. That fucker is dangerous. That was what the witch had been saying all along. Stand guard, Scanlon instructed his flunkies. I don't want any more interruptions. He pointed to Mason. He's our guest. We don't want him leaving to get the others. Fuck. If he kills Valencia. In the cage, Scanlon grunted, then his bear exploded from within as if consuming Todd Hole. One minute Scanlon was there, the next minute the bear. The transformation was immediate. Mason had never seen anything like it. Is that what Bronson's touch does? Makes him shift so fucking quickly. Scanlon stood on his hind legs and roared, his huge paws flailing, more lethal than kitchen knives, his razor-tipped claws raked at the air. Mason was starting to see what Leandra meant. And now he began to worry. He couldn't let this happen. If Valencia was hurt. In Mason's head, his lion snarled and began a push. 
Mason didn't hold his inner beast back. He knew what he had to do. He had to protect Valencia at all costs. His lion foolishly took charge, without wondering how in the hell Mason would get into the cage in his lion form. Fur sprouted from pores, covering him. His face broadened, his jaw hurt where a lion's canines replaced his human teeth. His bones ached as they stretched, pulling and pushing, transforming him from a man into a full mane larger than average lion. His tendons burned where they yielded his human body to his lion. Seconds later, but still much longer than it had taken Scanlan to morph to his ferocious bear, Mason stood in front of the cage, his roar fierce. A piercing burning sensation struck his hindquarters. Mason swung his mighty lion head back to see what had caused the pain. God damn it! His lion bellowed his anger at the trank dart embedded in his muscle. And the same moment, the dizziness began to strike him. Any second, he knew he'd be knocked out. Darkness never came, though. Mason collapsed to the concrete floor. He couldn't move his limbs or his head. All he could do was helplessly watch the scene playing out directly in front of him. Scanlan moved around the inside of the cage in his bare form, lumbering in a loose circle. Valencia stood in the middle, no weapon in her hand, and not shifting into her tigress. Mason had to help her. He simply had to. He tried to move his leg, but all he could see was one toe twitching for all his efforts. Why is he still awake? One asked, his words a long drawn out southern drawl. He knew the shifter was talking about him. You used the wrong one, came from a voice behind him. I used the one we had preloaded for him, southern accent said. Yeah, because Todd wanted him conscious but unable to fight. I'll shoot him with another. Give me your weapon. Fuck no moron. You give him another dose, you may kill him. That's not so bad, is it, he drawled. It is if Todd didn't say to kill him. And he didn't. So no. No more tranks. Mason tuned out the two shifters talking behind him and tried to focus his now blurry vision on the cage and the snarls coming from within. As if they were in a fog, he watched Valencia's skull widen, her face took on a mix of tigress and human features, as if frozen in a mid-shift. She snarled, revealing teeth that were definitely vampire-like in a face that remained in a blended feline and human form. Her eyes were blood-red. She emitted a low hiss. Mason blinked his lion eyes, hoping to clear his vision, to better see what the hell she was. She'd stayed in a human body, but wasn't human. She laped toward Scanlan's bear, did some type of contortion of her body, then was on his back, her fangs buried deeply into his flesh. She twisted her head, moving it back and forth, ripping his flesh into shreds. Behind him, one of the shifters gasped. Another one said, what the fuck? She's a hybrid, a voice with a European accent said. French or Austrian, if Mason was taking a guess. I saw one in Europe. Scanlan doesn't stand a chance. Relief flowed through Mason, hopefully Valencia would prevail. He wanted to step in, to do something. Anything. He didn't even have enough of his strength to shift back to his human form. How long was this damn trank going to last? Valencia leapt off Scanlan's bear, her face dripping with blood. She wiped it with her hand, smearing it in scarlet streaks across her unusual hybrid features. Scanlan's bear rushed her, knocking her backward. Instead of falling, she rolled, twisted, and leapt to her feet with the ease of a gymnast. Scanlan stood on his rear legs, flailing at her, blood pouring from his shredded flesh. Valencia sidestepped and landed a kick into his knee. When Scanlan dropped his bear's head to look at his knee, she took the opportunity and was back on him, this time almost riding him in a bizarre, circus-like maneuver. Her claws were out, long and lethal, deadlier than a tigress's. She buried them into his shoulder, while she latched onto his neck with her teeth. For what seemed like a second, but could have been an eternity, Mason's eyelids became too heavy to lift. When he opened his eyes again, Scanlan's bear was deadweight on the floor, the room was brightly lit, a scream rang in his ears, and he was in his human form. Mason raised his head. The screaming stopped, but not before he caught the source. Evie. Behind her stood Lazare, 
a blonde Mason didn't recognize, Alexa, Reese, Theo, and the witch. Rory was sprinting in front of them, running toward the cage. Mason focused on the cage again. Valencia was opening the door. Her face was totally human, but streaked with blood, as was her clothing. Rory wrapped his arms around her. You're killing me. Do you know I was worried you were dead? He licked his thumb and began to clear blood from her cheek. Behind Theo, shifters were streaming in, all in human form. From their stance it was clear they were Theo's men. Scanlan's men were in a tight group, watching the flood of shifters striding in the double doors. Evie ran toward Mason. She leaned down, balancing on one knee. Her face was tear-streaked. Are you okay? Mason sat up and nodded, not trusting his vocal cords to relay the information without sounding like gibberish. You, you, I, we were concerned about you. She rose. I need to check on Valencia. Her voice was choked up, tears barely at bay. Chapter 19 Evie fidgeted with the bottled water in front of her. She, her siblings, their mates, Theo, Leandra, and of course, Mason, were all assembled at a conference table in the underground facilities of the now-dead Todd Scanlon. Todd's shifter henchmen were in cages, waiting for the Shifter Supreme Council to send compliance enforcers to collect them and to see that they were tried for their roles in abducting shifters for Todd Scanlon's underground fighting ring. Valencia had put on clothing that wasn't bloody, confiscated from Todd's guest quarters. Rory refused to let her out of his sight, even when she went to change. Her hands still shook from the stress and adrenaline. She fought looking at Mason, fought the urge to drink in the sight of the handsome lion shifter. Seeing him lying on the floor, not sure if he was alive. She let out a deep breath, then noticed no one was talking. They were all staring at her. She chanced a peek. Even Mason was staring at her. What? She glanced from face to face. What did I miss? Alexa asked how you were. Laser frowned. I'm fine. I'm not the one that killed a bear shifter and walked away without a scratch. Evie faced Valencia. And I still don't understand it. Valencia's smile was tight. It's complicated. Everything seemed complicated. Lazare was with Natalia. Alexa and Valencia were mated to the Nielsen twins. Theo now had a witch for a mate. And they wonder why I'm confused. I'd like a moment of your time. Mason's features were drawn into a frown. He was still hot, still the man she couldn't get over. Now? Here. God. I can't discuss this shit with him publicly. No, it can be in private when we're done. Valencia cleared her throat. Before you go. She bit her lip. Evie thought of the way her sister had appeared when they'd first entered the room, right after she'd killed Todd. Her sister looked nothing like the magnificent tigress, or the beautiful curvaceous woman Evie knew. She resembled a creature designed to kill, one designed to petrify. Valencia had explained she'd shared blood with a vampire, that it had changed her, made her what Leandra called a hybrid. Before you two go, I think I should let you know something Scanlan told me in private. He boasted that he had a picture photoshopped. Evie's gaze snapped toward Mason, then back at her sister. That can't be. Mason appeared puzzled. It's true, Valencia affirmed, her face serious. What pick is this? Mason glanced from Evie to Valencia, then back to Evie again. It's... Evie felt the flush of anger rising to her face. It's private, Valencia asserted. For when the two of you talk alone. Mason nodded. And that will be when... After we get matters settled here, Valencia said then looked at Lazare as if remembering he was the Alpha. Evie studied her baby sister. She had changed. Gone was the carefree woman she used to know. Gone was the happy-go-lucky Valencia. In her place was a woman who was more than ready to step into an Alpha position. Hell, she acts as if she already is an Alpha. We should get back to Arsino Point. Did I miss the rest of Escape Weekend? Evie hadn't seen the sun or a cell phone since Todd Scanlon brought her down here. There will be other years. 
Alexa touched Reese's hand. Lazare turned to Theo. Can your men handle this until the enforcers arrive to take custody of Scanlan's men? Theo nodded. Scanlan's body has been removed. None of these shifters know who Valencia is. I recommend she get out of the area before the enforcers find out there's a hybrid here. They'd have to hunt her down. Theo's dark eyes were trained on Valencia. Sorry. Valencia's lips curled. Evie wasn't sure if it was a smile or a self-deprecating smirk. I understand. That won't be a problem, though. I don't have plans to be here. I have to leave the area. She turned to Lazare. That includes Arsenault Point. Lazare frowned. I'm not tracking. What do you mean? Alexa's voice had risen an octave in concern. Let's talk about this when we get back, Rory declared. I may have a solution. Leandra glanced at Theo. Theo nodded. Lazare's growl was audible. What is his problem with her? Evie suspected it had more to do with the typical animosity between shifters and witches. Evie and Mason can ride with us, Alexa said. We can catch her, them, up on everything that's happened during escape weekend. Let's go to my cabin. It's not spacious, but we can gather on the porch to discuss matters. It's a safe neutral place. And there will be no interruptions. I'll be out there in a moment. Let me give a final instruction. We'll wait with Leandra until you come out. I appreciate it. Theo's gaze was dark and full of yearning for his mate. He started toward the room holding Scanlan's shifters prisoners in a cage. Be out there in a moment. The rest of the group filed through the dark hallways toward the entrance, a hidden door in a warehouse in the midst of the industrial district. Evie shielded her eyes against the brightness. Graffiti peppered the walls of the warehouse, designed to appear abandoned. Outside the roads and alleys were nearly empty of vehicles. Where did the people watching the fight park? How did their cars not attract attention? They had to park elsewhere and were brought here in a bus. Scanlan took extreme measures to keep the place a secret, Lazare explained. How did you find it? Lazare and Reese exchanged a glance, then her brother answered. We have mutual acquaintances, who found it in their best interest to help us. Reese nodded in agreement. Why do I get the feeling, there's a lot more to this than I'm hearing? She followed Alexa toward her car. Valencia and Rory got in theirs. Leandra stood with Alexa and Evie, waiting for Theo. I'm worried about Valencia, Evie said, watching her sister and Rory in the car. She's very different. She's at a crossroads in many ways. But deep down she's still the same, Alexa said. Just a little more intense. Evie didn't want to say she felt like it was a lot more than just a little, so she nodded. I'll catch you up on everything while we're driving home. Alexa put her arm around Evie. They both watched Mason who was talking to Reese and Lazare by Lazare's car. Natalia had already gotten in and was waiting for Lazare. You have a lot to catch me up on, like you and Reese. Lazare and Natalia. Yeah, that one caught me off guard, Alexa confessed. Everything's catching me off guard. Evie couldn't take her eyes off Mason. Photoshop. The idea that maybe he'd never been unfaithful, that all this time she had made a decision on misinformation weighed on her. An anger burned within her toward Todd Scanlon even though he was dead. Mason all six-foot-plus sexy of him was walking her way. The darkness in his gaze told her they had unfinished business. The dilation of his pupils made her heart skip a beat and then begin a rapid tempo. Broad shoulders that tapered toward a hard stomach, thighs with quads so pronounced they strained the fabric of his pants, his sleeves pushed up showing off the forearms she'd always found sexy. She took a deep breath, then let it out slowly, cautioning her tigress to step back before both of them decided to jump on him the moment they were alone. And then a thought struck Evie, a very sobering thought. What if Mason doesn't want me? Sure, he looks like he's interested in me, but what if that's just his lion for my tigress? What if he wants nothing to do with me, because I never told him why I was ending it? 
The visage of him began to swim in the tears that filled her eyes. She looked down, swiped at her eyes furtively, then turned away from him so he wouldn't see the naked emotions in her eyes. Are you okay? Alexa's touch was gentle on her arm. I'm fine. Evie plastered a smile on her face. It will work out. Leandra's silver blue eyes glowed. Evie climbed into the back seat. Chapter 20 Mason sat in the back next to Evie. Alexa drove Reese Road shotgun. Of course, saying he sat next to Evie was a stretch. Evie seemed to be pushed up as far away from him as she could be, practically hugging the door. At least during the first portion of the drive back to Arsino Point. Then Alexa and Reese began to update Evie and Mason by default since he was there. And she relaxed a bit, leaning forward and sometimes closer to the center, poking her head between the seats to talk to Alexa. He couldn't help but look at her, taking in the tight t-shirt she'd changed into, the way it hugged her curves, pulled tightly against breasts that strained the material thin, making her lacy black bra all too evident. Also not for a second did it hide her nipples, which for fuck's sake were hard nubs tempting Mason the whole damn drive. She was in a skirt, her curves accentuated, especially those hips and thighs that flared outward from her waist. Mason fought the raging boner and his lion's reaction at the same time fearful that at any point of time he'd lose the battle. The only saving grace was that Alexa and Reese were there to keep Mason from ravaging her. Her hair was a mess that brought to mind the mornings they'd stayed in bed late, engaging in sexual acrobatics that left her with a bedhead, flushed cheeks and sparking eyes. Mason gritted his teeth against the pain it caused in him to think of what they used to have and what they didn't have now. God, I miss her. At one point, her thigh rubbed against his knee, and a surge of electricity coursed through Mason. God, he'd forgotten what her touch did to him. Alexa briefed them on how Lazare had left the ball to find Natalia, and ended up with her. They brought home a distant relative by marriage. Really? Who? How is it we didn't know? She's old. And she's got an, she's an elemental. Her name is Claudette. She was mated to one of the Arsino. Knew Etienne and Celine when she was younger. You'll like her, Alexa assured her, then went on to explain how she and Reese had found their attraction. Insatiable, Reese said with a smile for the curvy redhead in the front seat. Alexa returned the smile. And then Rory and Valencia. She looked at Mason and Evie in the rearview mirror. Those two. What's Valencia going to do? It sounds like she can't be at home. Can she go back to Georgia? Is she going to be staying with Rory? Mason wondered the same. Rory would have his hands full, with a hybrid as alpha and as powerful as Valencia seemed to have become. What about Leandra and Theo? All this time, I thought he had a crush on you, Evie asked Alexa. Not exactly. Leandra had to charm him, or cast a spell on him, or use some kind of sorcery. That had to be difficult, for her. I'm not sure I could have done that with a man I love. I'm not the sharing type. Evie gave Mason a glance when she said that. He wondered if there was something he was supposed to take from that. Yeah, we have a lot to clear up as soon as we have a moment alone. Reese's hand traveled along the back of the seat, until it met Alexa's shoulder. Reese made tiny patterns. It reminded Mason of when he used to do something like that with Evie. Seemed they all had someone now. Her siblings. Leandra and Theo. Everyone but Mason and Evie. It was all about everyone else. Everyone but him. And the woman he loved. And his lion's mate. Everyone but them. They all had their happily ever after. All but us. His resolve set in. He'd figure this out. Immediately. Or he'd fail and get the hell away from anything that reminded him of Evangeline Arsenault. Alexa drove past the Arsenault Point driveway and toward a semi-pebble paved dirt road. She pulled up next to Theo's vehicle. They barely opened the car doors when Theo came out of the woods and made his way toward them 
taking quick steps with a long-legged stride. Blazer's running a bit late. We'll wait for him to get started. Follow me to the cabin. I'd like a moment, Mason said. They all turned to look at him, but he kept his gaze fixed on Evie. With you. Mason made sure she understood she was the one he wanted to talk to. I. Stay. Alexa pushed Evie back into the car. No big feet, as Evie still had one leg in the vehicle. Alexa nodded to Mason over the car's hood. At least one of the Arsenault sisters is on my side. He slid his large frame next to Evie in the back seat. I know what you're going to say. Evie bit her lip. Why don't you tell me then? Because in reality, he had no clue where to start. That I was wrong. That you weren't in that picture. She paused. Green eyes the color of a tropical lagoon studied him. See, I don't even know what picture you're talking about. Well, seems Todd confessed to doctoring it, so I'm guessing it wasn't you. What wasn't me? A red color kissed her cheeks, then flamed darker as her embarrassment grew. Mason didn't want to admit it, but he'd never found her more incredible, sexier than right this moment. And he'd never loved her as much as he did right now. A girl. She drew a breath in, then let it out slowly. She was going down on a guy. Let me guess. I was that guy. Evie nodded. But. She swallowed hard. Her delicate throat working, giving him all the wrong damned ideas. How can I think of sex at a time like this? Man, I'm such a douchebag. Except he wasn't, not totally, because he realized his lion was contributing to the craving for Evie and her tigress. But he prompted. But I know now it wasn't you. Todd set it up, did some photoshopping on the picture. She glanced at her fingers, which were intertwining and moving constantly with nervousness. Evie. Fingertip on her chin, he pushed gently until she was looking into his eyes. You should have come to me. I know. I'd never cheat on you. Not in my mind, not with my body. Her eyes bored into his soul, seeking answers. He knew she'd seen the worst sides of infidelity. It was incumbent he showed her he'd never do that. I wish. Tell me what you wish. When he said that, he thought of his kit in his back pocket. He thought of lost chances, lost lives, lost friends. He was unconditionally unwilling to lose her. I wish there was a rewind button I could press. Something that would take me back to that moment. A thought occurred to him. Why the hell not? Why couldn't he suggest it? Why couldn't they do it? It wasn't anything more than a damned misunderstanding. It's not like either of them wanted someone else. I have an idea. He took her hand in his. Again, the electricity, the chemistry between them was tangible. She looked at him, eyes full of trust. This was the old Evie. His Evie. Who says we can't press rewind? You don't hate me. As Mason saw it, there were two choices. He could spend a lifetime loving her from this moment on, or he could hate her for the past. And he'd be as lonely and as miserable as he'd been all this time. This tigress, feisty, bratty, fiercely loyal, and almost childlike in her innocence, was the woman he wanted and the mate his lion needed. I couldn't hate you any more than I could hate the very air I need, Evie. Her face crumpled into an ugly cry mask for a brief second, right before it beamed with the largest grin. You say the most amazing things. Her voice was heavy with emotion. Is it really possible? Unless for some crazy reason you want to keep on hating me. God, no. Her squeal was pure joy. She shot across the seat and fell into him, as if they'd never been apart. They fit perfectly. Just like they used to. Mason breathed her in. He took her essence in. The scent of her love. The scent of her desire. I'm making you mine first chance I get. He felt her heart rate quicken with excitement. I'd like that very much. They stayed there, holding each other. Their bodies joined as their tigress and lion joined as their souls joined. 
They were there for what seemed like a long time, but all the same, seemed not long enough. Tires crunched the pebbles on the dirt road. Mason glanced up. Lazare and Natalia were pulling up. Looks like it's time for us to go, he murmured in her hair. Can you stay at Arsenal Point after escape weekend? For a short time. He knew she'd struggle if she had to leave her home for his in Florida. Sure. I can. For a short time. Forever. Chapter 21 Evie and Mason held hands on the walk through brush, cypress, and evergreen trees. They stayed on the path, following Lazer and Natalia. It was surreal to Evie, like time had stood still and she and Mason had never been apart. She wasn't going to question Mason's decision to put it all aside, as it was her heart's desire, but she did wonder if losing his friend had given Mason the outlook he had. Five minutes into the walk, Alexa and Reese joined them. We were beginning to wonder if we should send the cavalry out for you, Alexa said. All six began the trek toward Leandra's place. Evie picked up the pace, getting closer to Lazare. Why do you hate Leandra so much? She asked him, figuring this was a better time than in front of Theo and Leandra. Lazare drew to a halt in the middle of the path, then turned her way. Leandra's great-great-grandmother was the one who helped Eddie N. Our families have a history. They're sworn to hatred. Except, she didn't help him quite the way he wanted. Evie was confused. But no one knows exactly why there is such animosity. Do we really need logic when tradition and culture are in place? Natalia took his hand, intertwined her fingers with his. Don't share. It was as if Lazare knew what she going to say. Natalia raised a brow, a tiny curve on her lip showed Evie exactly what this curvy blonde was to her brother. Evie realized the calming influence the former Spitfire had on her brother. She recognized the inner peace his tiger had, a peace he'd never indicated before. Yes, Evie could definitely come to love this blonde white tigress shifter her brother had taken for a mate. Even the hard to win over Alexa's eyes twinkled as she watched Lazare react to Natalia. Alexa leaned her head against Reese's shoulder. So basically, there's no good reason? The answers are in Etienne's journals, Lazare said. Don't tell me you, of all people, haven't read them. Evie laughed. She knew how much Lazare loved their family's history. He had to have, even though no one else probably had. I have not. I don't have access to his journals. So how do you know the answer is contained within? Alexa asked. Grandfather told me. Lazare frowned at the questioning. Evie wanted to roll her eyes. I think for Theo's sake and the sake of your friendship with him, you should consider changing your stance on Leandra. Agreed. Alexa's tone was firm. She's been a strong ally to all of us. She's been invaluable to me, and especially to Valencia. Lazer cocked his head, studying Evie and Alexa as if appraising them. When did my baby sisters grow up? He smiled, then peered down at Natalia. I may be stubborn. Bullheaded, Alexa whispered. Insufferable, Evie added also in a whisper. Natalia giggled. Lazare gave them a mock dirty look. I know when I'm beat. You're right. For Theo. For Valencia. For you, Alexa. I'll let bygones be bygones with Leandra Matthew. Alexa nodded. Evie didn't say a word. She knew as Alpha, concessions weren't always easy for Lazare. They began the walk toward Leandra's again, and moments later were walking up a ramp. Mist surrounded the ramp that connected the slight cabin's wraparound porch, such as it was because it wasn't much of one, and it was in need of repair and paint. The entrance of the ramp was half buried in solid ground, extending over the swamp's brownish water, eventually touching the porch. Valencia perched against the hand railing on the porch. Half her body was against the wood, and the other half pressed against Rory, who'd almost seemed to have trapped her against the beam, as if he were worried she'd try to escape. Theo leaned against the wall, while Leandra sat in the rocking chair in front of him, barefooted. Everything okay? Theo asked Lazare. 
It's decided. The guests are mostly gone. They understood, there were matters to be taken care of. Ms. Claudette is settled in. She's anxious to visit with May. What did you tell her? Natalia asked Lazare. I knew Ms. Claudette when I volunteered. She paused, held back a laugh. It's a long story. Let's just say I'm close to her. Evie almost didn't hide her double take. Natalia. Volunteer. Somehow the words didn't seem to belong in the same sentence. But then again, this seemed to be a very different Natalia from the one they'd first met months ago. I told her we'd make sure she got to visit May. Somehow. Maybe a road trip is in order, Cher. I'm up for another one. Natalia's smile reached her twinkling eyes. Lazer kissed her temple tenderly, and again Evie found herself thankful her brother finally had someone. We need to take care of business at hand. Lazer looked at Valencia pointedly. His gaze took in Rory as well. Namely, Valencia. Hybrids will be hunted. I go where she goes. Rory's tone was lined with steel resolve. I figured no less. Leandra has a suggestion. Theo's eyes remained on Lazare, as if to gauge what sort of reaction he'd have and how he'd treat Leandra. Glad to hear it. Lazare's tone was earnest. Evie was proud of her brother for his behavior. Valencia, you have to go away. I know. Valencia's irises had a crimson ring around the perimeter. I've gotten better at containing the bloodlust. But so help me God, Valencia interrupted herself with a mirthless laugh. The irony at the idea of mentioning God in the same sentence as a vampire's bloodlust. Evie smiled but knew it was tinged with sadness. Her tigress warned her there was a difference with her sister. The four Arsenault siblings' dynamics had changed. Anyway so help me, I can't always stop the lust to kill. Valencia wrapped her arms around herself, leaned back against Rory. Rory encircled her in his embrace, her back against his chest, his cheek against her hair. So she wants to harness the power she has. Harness? Reese cocked his head and gave his brother an inquisitive look. And I will be with her. Rory tightened his grip on Valencia. Always. I need you, dear family, Valencia looked at each of them in turn. I need you to help me make sure the vampire that did this to me doesn't die. If he dies, I'll die. That's a myth, isn't it? Evie found that hard to swallow. How can you be sure? Valencia pulled free of Rory's grasp and raised her black t-shirt in front, almost to her bra. An angry red line crossed the length of her torso. This appeared on its own. Suddenly, I was losing blood before I could heal it with my shifter healing. Rory had me go into a hibernating heal, but what if he hadn't? What if I'd been in the middle of something, and couldn't do that? She shook her head, her gaze locked with Leandra's. You would die. Leandra finished Valencia's train of thought. I would. Valencia turned back to Lazare. So please keep that bastard alive. Don't kill him if you can avoid it. I'll make sure of that, little sister. I'm leaving the territory. I can't tell you where I'm going, but Leandra is making arrangements. Rory and I will be traveling and off the grid. I'll get a disposable phone and call you. I'm sure sooner or later, it will get out that Scanlan was killed by a hybrid. They'll be after me. I'll make the arrangements, Leandra said. I know a place she can go where she will be safe and helped with managing her needs. Evie was filled with a sense of bittersweet sentiments. On one hand, she had Mason, and every one of her siblings were happily mated, and at the same time, she'd lose Valencia. Hey. Valencia took Evie's hand. Stop that. It will blow over. How can it? At least now I have a chance at a life, Valencia declared. I spent too much time avoiding people and moonlight. Now I have something. And Rory. Mostly Rory. Be happy for me. Evie smiled but tears of sadness filled her eyes at the same time. Her tigress howled. Mason wrapped his arm around her and pulled her against his body. His lion comforted her tigress. 
We should get back to Arsino Point, Lazare announced. We need to make arrangements. He turned to Leandra. Would you be our guest and stay at Arsino Point? Leandra's eyes gleamed silver. Could I stay in one of the cabins? Certainly. Lazare smiled, though apprehension lurked in his eyes. Evie knew he still hated staying in the cabins. I'd like to stay in the same one I stayed in before, Evie said. You mean the time Mason came down for escape weekend? Evie nodded, the heat of a blush crept its way upward. She turned to Mason. Did you mean it? Will you stay a while? As long as you want me. Forever. Epilogue Evie rolled over in her bed, relishing the sounds of Arsino Point, the scent of Arsino Point. And everything was made perfect, because Mason was here with her. Mason. His name slid off her lips with ease, as if years had not passed without each other. His teeth nipped at her jawline, traveling downward, and his tongue trailed hotness down her neck to the neckline of her sleep t-shirt. I want you, he snarled as his fingers played with the fabric. Evie's breath escaped her quickly with each movement, as he traced patterns into the cotton material. Each motion his fingers made teased and tortured her. She craved him. His lips landed on hers in a kiss that was tender. And then just as quickly, his fingers turned into claws and shredded the fabric. He leaned back, studying the creamy tops of her breasts, ivory swells rising above her ribcage. Beautiful. Mason's fingertips traced her skin, teasing her in the most delicious of ways that culminated in a buzzing that ran the length of her body. His fingertips tiptoed their way down the middle of her sternum, over her abdomen. I need you, he rumbled, touching the hem on her panties. The sound of the panting coming from her mouth was the only thing Evie could hear. I want you too. She wanted everything he was, and everything they had been. She wanted his strength, his easy smile, the intensity behind his dark eyes and his love to be for her. She couldn't stop her hands from drifting to his shoulders. His muscles flexed beneath her hands. She forked her fingers through his hair. His tongue followed the path his fingers had created, leaving a hot trail from the top of her breast to the center of her stomach, drifting down to her panties. He ran the course of her panties, tracing the elastic from hip to hip. Jesus, he groaned, pushing at her hips and thighs. Evie raised her lower body while he pulled her panties down. Mason's breath was hot, warming her, a forerunner of the heat and pleasure he would deliver between her legs. She released a groan, and it pushed him further. He continued to travel downward, every gust of his breath warmed her body. He licked his way lower. Her clit throbbed. He nipped at the tender skin. She closed her eyes, expecting him to lick her slowly. Evie jumped when his entire face dove into her with a ferocity that revealed his hunger. Her body ached with desire for him, too much time apart. Her breath rushed in and out, lungs burning with the need for air. Mason's lips sucked on her, teasing, then releasing with a popping sound that drove her desire. He devoured her repeatedly, mercilessly, until finally he thrust his tongue into her, going in, then out, pleasing her. Her hands grabbed the sheets, gripping tightly. She bit down on her lip to keep from begging. The moan that came made his tongue move faster. Please, she whispered. Electricity flowed through her blood. Her toes curled. Mason. Her pitch and tone were almost a scream. What? Mason's voice was more of a growl. I need you. Her impatient fingers traveled to his hair, pushing his face closer to her desire, taking his tongue deeper. She flinched in surprise and pleasure when he slipped a finger in and moved his mouth to her clit and began sucking while his finger pleasured her. A low moan began and rose to a crescendo, as she climaxed swiftly and brutally, clamping her thighs around his head. Evie's body trembled. An occasional aftershock ripped through her, making her flinch and jerk in his arms. The lion in Mason pulled at him to take her to make her his. Forever. Also to give her what she needed. No, what they both needed. He wanted to be so deep inside her she'd pulse against his cock when she climaxed. Each of her peaks would create a tightening that pressed him to a climax of his own. He'd never forgotten that. He wanted that back. 
He groaned against her mouth. Are you ready to be mine? Yes. With a thrust that spoke of his urgent need for this woman, for her tigress, for their ultimate bonding, he dropped his boxers and with one smooth motion slid inside all the way. He fit in her just as he always had, perfectly. They were made for each other. A deep sigh slipped out in a whoosh at his imminent homecoming to the woman he'd never stopped loving. He paused, relishing her body, her tightness, and the way her muscles gripped him. He started slow and intense, with a rhythm that matched the passion he'd kept penned up all this time. Each time his cock slipped out, his lion growled to be back inside her. His lion didn't let Mason keep a slow pace. He began to stroke, powerfully and vigorously, his body tight like an elastic band ready to snap any moment. He pushed into her his eyes locked with hers. Her tigress growled and his lion picked it up, roaring in return. His rhythm became quicker and built to a frantic pace, each thrust resulting in an exhaled breath. Sheer primal lust, and a need to have his mate with him without interference pushed him faster and faster as he began to lose control. His body traveled toward the point of no return as the volcano within him began to careen. A light sheen of perspiration made Evie's face glisten. He studied her features while he lowered his forehead to hers, kissing her lips, tasting the very essence of her on her mouth. He felt her orgasm begin as she tightened around him and tried to scream. He drank her scream in while he grunted as a pulse of his release began to come undone. Lowering his head, Mason sank his teeth into the tender spot at the corner of her shoulder and neck. He bit fiercely, taking no prisoners except Evie, and in return giving her himself. He licked the spot, tasting the metallic flavor of her blood, sealing an irreversible covenant between them with a couple bond. Her hands rose and buried themselves in his hair. She brought his face to hers for a kiss, her tongue tasting his, yielding to his and at the same time taking charge. He pulled away slightly. It's done. She smiled. It's very done. And it's just starting. He collapsed next to her, his ear resting on her breast, listening to her heartbeat, listening to his own sink with hers. Mason? Um. He'd almost drifted to sleep. What would you think about traveling? The oddness of her question made the drowsiness diminish. Traveling's fine. Why? I thought maybe we could visit Valencia and Rory sometime. Her voice became sleepy. He kissed her shoulder. Anything you want. Anywhere you want. M M M H M M M. She drew the sound of agreement out as her eyelids began to close. He kissed the tender spot that had already healed where he'd marked her as his. Forever. I love you. Me too. Her response was murmured while a smile drifted to her lips. Thank you for listening. This has been a Shifters Forever Worlds book by L. Thorne. Stay tuned for more episodes. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.